<laughs> well, hello. Well, hello. <laughs> hey, Mike, how are you, sir? <laughs> hello. Well, hello. That's uh, I think that's our new official pencil to pencil greeting. Well, hello. Well, hello. Um, do they have well, more hello. than one of those countdown things? Like, do they have more uh, of those, uh, different kinds of folly things? Like, uh, oh no, it's oh, like stuff. like falling leaves or something. No, it's just yeah. that one. We could we might have to make our own, but I, I like the countdown. That's sexy. Um, everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome back to Pencil to Pencil, your favorite pandemic podcast. Uh, you remember us. We took a week off uh, to uh, refuel our jet engines, uh, <laughs> but we're back. We're back and ready to rock and roll. Uh, I am Jamar Nicholas, your first host, uh, Philadelphia's favorite son, and also your internet best friend uh, and cartoonist of good letters. Uh, I am joined, as always, by my good bud, Modern Master, Mike Manley. Say hi, Mike. Hi, Modern Master. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this this very excellent podcast is always brought to you by good friends at Graphicsly who create Clip Studio Paint, the cartoonist uh, secret tool in their kit. And also, <laughs> it's like we're going to fail our, our DUI uh, test. We can't point our, our nose on our finger. Right. Uh, and oh, also, you got to they have a little mirror to hold up to make sure you get it right. <laughs> Well, my this guy's not teacher. drunk. He got he gets it right. You're a teacher. You should. You're used to like your left, my right, my left, your right, right. You flip. You flip. You, you reflip it. You reflip it. Uh, also, uh, pencil to pencils brought to you by our good buddy John Morrow, who runs Tomorrow's Publishing. Uh, we That's are uh, chronicling comic book history and living it at the same time. Uh, please uh, go to his site, tomorrows.com, and buy a little piece of that history. Uh, also, I think our, they're still running their 40% off. I love they it. Were last week. Yeah. Yeah, man. Go cop some of that goodness. Also, and, you, and, and we should tell people if yes. they, during the show, yes, sure they do it during the show. Yes. If you send an email to Mike at actionplanet.com. Hold on. Let me put your John up. Go ahead. All right. With, <laughs> with, uh, the date of tonight's show mm -hmm. and our guest, mm -hmm. you will be able to uh, get a magazine, a free digital copy of Draw or any other Tomorrow's Magazine that there is a digital copy of. Wow, my God. For, for two people right now. Just right now. Not right later. Now. Right, now. Not right, right now. now. After the show's over, no mas. I love it. All right, man. And so and there's one left because I'm gonna do I'm gonna do the first one. Right. Okay. All right. Right now. <laughs> no, there's Hurry there's up. two. That sounds excellent, man. I can't wait. So yeah, get on that, guys. All right, Mike. Um, we have so much to catch up catch up on, but I want to um give our guest his uh just do. So I wanna I'm gonna do a bio. <laughs> And that's I get to pull out my Terry Gross NPR voice, Mike Man. Oh, okay. All right. I'm I'm going to read off of this the, the published by Tomorrow's. Look at that. That's that's product placement right there. That's the right. Uh, the Modern Masters. Uh, I'm going to read off the back matter and introduce my man here. <clears throat> All right, you ready for my NPR voice? Go, Terry. <sighs> Jerry Ordway, Superman, Captain Marvel, the Justice Society, classic heroes all, and no one does classic better than Jerry Ordway. This is a lot. I'll read it real fast. With his keen sense of anatomy, proportion, lighting, and detail, he draws superheroes that are powerful, noble, and most importantly, heroic. And not only is he a penciler, inker, and painter of the highest caliber, he can write a great story as well. From his beginnings as anchor, then pencil, penciler on All-Star Squadron, to his work on the Superman titles, the Parents' Choice Award-winning The Power of Shazam. You know about that, Mike Manley. Mm. And his creator owned The Messenger. Jerry Ordway has proven himself to be one of the most talented and versatile comic book creators of our time. Pencil to Penciliers, please welcome our good buddy, Jerry Ordway. <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> Although you, now next time you have to read it like 
the guy who used to do those monster machine commercials. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Hey, Jerry, welcome to the podcast. How's everything hey with you? Good. Everything's good. You have awesome. power. Yes, as of Sunday night. That was a long stretch. How many like days? Tuesday around 2 in the afternoon, tree fell on our power line, like on the power line to the house. So it, you know, just went boom. And uh, it was out till Sunday night about 9, I think around 9 o'clock, something like that. Do you have a so generator? Like, uh, no. Are you we thinking about getting like, one? Yeah, everybody does. Right? <laughs> My, the, the guy, the tree guy that I use, he said, you know what? Go on like Craigslist in about two weeks. Everybody will be selling theirs. <laughs> really? Because, <laughs> that's, that's, you know, two weeks of power, maybe like back into that sense of full security, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a real thing. I have uh, uh, just stranded in my Amazon cart one of those crank flashlights oh, with yeah, the yeah. radio. Yeah. I, haven't, I haven't ordered it yet. I, a, <laughs> I actually am really glad. At Christ, around Christmas time, I bought a, a portable solar charger for a phone. Yeah. And I wound up, you know, having that actually came in, in handy. I used it a couple times to charge. And I wasn't, I didn't have any cell service either. So I was just using it to charge to listen to audiobooks or. You know, just so it wasn't so quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, can get, you can get used to it. Like after, you know, I don't know. I didn't have, I didn't, wasn't on deadline, so I didn't have to worry about that. But um, in 2012, when we had, I guess, Hurricane Sandy, we had power out for about four and a half days. And I was oh. on deadline with the human bomb. And I had wow. moved my drawing table over to the window. And I wound up drawing like three and a half pages, or penciling and inking three and a half pages during that blackout just getting up early in the morning working till you know i couldn't really see and the editor they had no they had no power problems there so you know it was right. kind of like i had to wait to scan everything and at one point i pulled i told him i said hey we have no power for like the last week but i got pages done and he goes oh when can you send them like no you know there was no <laughs> real Hey, good job. You worked in the dark. You get your your Harry Potter owl will fly it into the to the office. Yeah. You're like you're like a working like a, this was like 1800 comics, right? You know, well, I used, the, I used the window as a light box. I did use the window as a light box. So that, that I did that, right. and I did that at San Diego one year when I was right. on deadline. The hotel window was a light box. <laughs> now you Man, can use, I I realized I could use my iPad. As a like a mini light box when I was if I needed a light box onto a cover you know like to do a sketch right cover or something. Um, so that was actually handy but yeah otherwise you're really up on the window if people don't understand that it's basically doing a drawing underneath and tracing it and tightening it up so basically two layers and you can yeah. see through the paper when you got it against the window so that's a that's a crazy dedication that I don't think a lot of uh, young people would really glom onto that easily. Like, well, like the power being out sounds like a perfect excuse not to finish this project. Right. <laughs> yeah, but then you can't watch all your anime, so then what? You can't go to Crunchyroll, then what? <laughs> well, but, oh, no. You know, it used to be that you really just couldn't miss a deadline. So it wasn't yeah. like the editor would say, I'll have someone pencil five pages, which I wouldn't want anyways. But, you know, you really aren't left with any choice. That's, you yeah. know, that's kind of what doing monthly comics is about. It's about sacrifice and, you know, not to make it into anything noble, but it, it, it really is, you know, you, you're on a treadmill and you can't like lose a step. You know, you can't be Lucy Ricardo, you know, stuffing candies down your shirt because you can't keep up with the boxing of chocolates or whatever. I mean, you just got to you got to stay on that treadmill. You got to keep working no matter what. But it saves cooking. It saves cooking. <laughs> you just stuff your shirt with candy in the morning, and then you just don't have to cook for the rest Dipping of the day. <laughs> chicken nuggets. That's right. That's right. You know, you get your chicken nuggets on one on one boob, and you get your chocolate on the other boob. You're all set. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, you don't want to. You don't want to like throw off your rhythm when you're drawing a, a page or something. Right? <laughs> if I get out to take a break, it'll take two hours to get back to speed. Well, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because when we were working on Power of the Sh of Shazam, 
that was 96 it was when i stopped monthly comics that's when we used to have the 12 week right you know hot debt which was if you were at 12 once you went past below 12 weeks it was like oh my god right you know, it was the hot it, list yeah the editorial yeah hot list. and now it's like what two weeks you turn something in today it's in the store in the week it's the printed price. in a matter of hours yeah i mean have you ever done a book like that i mean where you're working right up to the end like i mm -hmm. had the last time i think i went through that was when we were doing that convergence thing for dc and I yeah wasn't drawing it i was just writing it but i wound up sitting with the colorist who was like in i want i want to say she was in italy or something and i was the i was kind of editing the color because the editor really didn't know any of the characters and uh i was you know i spent like a whole day just being in front of the computer and saying oh this character's green this character's blue you know to, for, to correct stuff and the book had to go to the printer by whatever 5 p.m friday and it was being printed over the weekend so it would be available like the next week <laughs> it was just right. like whoa that's instant yeah. comedy yeah well i think at that time dc had still not switched over to i don't know if they were still sending everything digital at that point i know when i was working at marvel they used to have the guy would take a bunch of the car of the the artwork the, the, all that stuff and they would drive it to the plant oh right supposedly there was a guy that was like you know you know louis coming here at five o'clock <laughs> you know you better make sure you got your doc hawk in you know and uh they would like this guy would literally be sitting i heard i never saw him but he supposedly was sitting in the bullpen and you yeah. know okay you know he'd come over and he would take the stuff and drive it to wherever they were making making the comics that week you know well, you, they used to have uh the color separators used to be in bridgeport um that did the oh, hand okay. separations was and that the old charlton people? people it was i don't remember it was a, its own crew i forget what it was what it was called but it was in bridgeport and it was mainly i guess housewives and they would just cut films and the guy who was the sales guy he would be in the office on Friday, like after he come in, he'd come in on Friday afternoon so that he could pick up pages. Every editor was done. He'd take like whatever stats of pages or whatever, and he would take them to uh, home with them on drive home or whatever. And those, you know, people would start working on the weekend. So it was. Mom, where's, where's dinner? Sorry, honey. I got to get Jimmy Olsen colored. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. I'm cutting some flesh tone for. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's really hard for, you know, anybody that's under thirty or probably even under forty at this point to even yeah. imagine how that was that was done. How, how actually how every step of the job was somebody drawing something by hand, lettering something by hand, you know, writing something on a right. typewriter, you know, cutting. Uh, mm -hmm. All the, well, the separations, photostatting, it was all done yeah. by somebody in a with a camera, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's it's definitely like the fact that you can scan stuff is. I like the the level of control you can have. Um, I kind of wish that I was able to scan my own stuff, even back in the early two thousands, because you know when you send artwork in, DC would scan it at one setting. It was kind of like done for speed. So yeah. if you had a little bit of subtle stuff on a page or if you used if you tried to use grease pencil or something, you know, with a little bit of grainy effect, the way they scanned everything, they scanned it so it would it would take out any pencil, you know, any hint of pencil. So it was all scanned really kind of harshly and it, it would always drop out. And I'd think, how how can I fix this? And it really I didn't get it, get a chance to, to fix it until I could scan my own. Even and, duotone. You know, Even duotone. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, uh, there's yeah. that that great dead man series that garcia lopez did oh, right yeah, yeah and the reproduction in every version is like not great because they like underexposed it right right mm. i mean mm -hmm. anybody who knows that the stuff the paper is kind of yellow you put a chemical on it and it's kind of gives it a yellow thing so if you shoot it black and white in the old days if you shot it in a black and white film or whatever they would it would just generally would drop out. I mean, it wasn't like it was yeah. kind of a no brainer for a stat camera, but with this, with a scanner, scanners are more subtle and they pick up so much little, I mean, they can pick, pick up the texture of the paper if you, you know, um, right. So mm -hmm. 
it's a case of being, you know, having the ability to, to be super subtle, but you really still need just that line quality to show up. Um, but yeah, it's well, a, now it's, you could, you could, you could, you can really, you could like have shot from Gene Colan's pencils now. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. You could have adjusted them to where you, you know, you could have skipped the inker, but you still would have had that, you could have had that black area with the gray or whatever. Colorist could have turned the gray into color. You know, yeah, there's a lot of, um, it's kind of cool, but at the same time, I appreciate the fact that when you have, say, six, those 64 colors to choose from, it feels like it's easier in some ways than sitting down with Photoshop where you have so many variations and subtleties that you can kind of lose the punch, basically the, you know, like whatever impact you could, you would throw blue against a cool, you know, like a cool color against a warm color or something to get contrast. When you're doing Photoshop, there's a tendency sometimes to paint and overpaint. So it looks like the old airbrush, you know, painting on a van, you know, yeah. it loses, yeah. it loses the clarity. It basically becomes kind of muddy. Um, so I, I like when I when I used to do the color guides for the Superman and the the flat color guides for the Superman covers, I liked the idea that you could use even like a ten percent blue, or you could use you could get really subtle. But you also they did they were afraid to use white because white just meant that nobody had to cut any screens for that. So for them it was like, hey, use all the white you want. But once it became computer stuff. I think even the editors felt like white looked blank. So they always, for the most part, stuff gets overcolored, you know? Yeah. You don't ever have that breathing room where you could see like a, just a pure white. Um, even the balloons are sometimes colored. So I think visually it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's a design thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, there was a, I think I told this before, there was a issue of Sergeant Rock by Russ Heath. That I got as a kid on a vacation to Canada, and it's in the snow, and it's the one where they're carrying this wounded soldier, and there's a bottle of plasma, and it gets shot, and then the blood's on the snow. And as a right. kid, there was no it was the it was just white. They yeah. just did white, and there I think sometimes you drop the panel borders. That was just so impressive to me yeah. as a kid because it really felt cold. It felt yeah. like the snow. Yeah. You know? Well, they also, I mean, the guys, there were there were people who colored poorly back then, but they colored because they were doing it. It was a volume job, and they assumed that as long as it was bright, it was fine. But there were people who did some really thoughtful uh, color, even, you know, like in the 60s, uh, some of the Marvel stuff, uh, some of the DC stuff, you'd still find a decent color job. Um, so I always hated the argument that, you know, well, you have to live with it. You know what I mean? It's like you're because the guy's late or, or you're late and he's coloring, you know, 15, 20 pages overnight or whatever. I always hated that excuse because, as you know, you, you spend so much time with the work that even if you're late or you're pushing it, you're still giving it the best you have. And yeah. you kind of feel like I expect that from everybody. You know what I mean? And you right. never, yeah. Yeah. you don't always, you didn't always get it. And it wasn't anybody's fault necessarily, except the colorist was at the end. Oh, well, of the sort of like the, yeah, it was like the default. Like if you want to see really bad coloring, I mean, I, I did the, the MST 3K stuff and they were pulling up all these old uh, like Charlton comics and oh, you know, yeah. domain <laughs> comics. And I mean, just the most garish <laughs> pink skies, you know, yeah. purple flowers. It was like the Crayola 8. Like they literally had like eight colors and they just used that for for everything, you know? Well, I think Charlton also used a duo shade in their color separation. That was, it gave it a weird look. But I think they used like a, <clears throat> I think they used the duo shade board or some kind of a process board to get the tones when they did color separation rather than have, having somebody cut it by hand. Because if you look at like, especially the the 70s Charlton's before they, you know, I guess before they went out of business, their coloring had a weird dot pattern effect to it. I don't know if you remember that, but it always, to me, it yeah. always felt cheap because, you know what I mean? It felt like, oh, these are, you know, this is just low quality or whatever. Uh, well, um, it's funny because, you know, uh, people coming into the business now 
have no idea in some respects how spoiled they are because they come in with like all this great production yeah. level of production that you can just do yourself really with your you know with your computer right and i mean we went through the whole flexographic thing you know where they were using the plastic <laughs> plates and everything i mean just the most i think that first transformer comic i did for marvel was printed on that and i mean it's yeah. just it you know it looks like they left it out in the desert for a year and it started to de decompose you know i think the fourth issue of crisis was done with flexo too and it horrified everybody the problem with flexa flexographic printing was the same as the problem when they started reprinting like old comics on slick paper it was just that they really should have desaturated the color you know, and instead they, they did the color as if it were newsprint, which newsprint, the old newsprint absorbed color, just like it absorbed the ink. You right. Know, so it wasn't, you could put color down. Most of it was lost in the kind of grayish tan of the paper. You know what I mean? So you, yeah. it, and you had to draw for that too. Like when you were, when I was inking stuff in the early eighties, you would ink and you tried to, it was that era where you were like putting thick lines around stuff. And it was like, oh, don't use Zipatone. I mean, I still used it and I took, you know, as a roll of the dice. But when I um, I got into comics is 40 years ago this summer it was actually my first D.C. job was in July of uh, 1980. And that was during that period, like 78, probably 1978 through. Were they still whaling then? Were they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In the, but in that time frame, there was like the printing was so bad and the paper quality was so bad that that was that era when, oh, comics are, are going to go away because they kept cutting production costs by cheaper and thinner paper and those presses were breaking down and everything. It's kind of funny to think about how it still took a couple of years, you know, for the, the use of offset printing. It really took like the flexographic was the last gasp of that type of printing yeah <clears throat> because it was cheap but uh once those machines started breaking you know they had no choice so i think you know they gradually moved into the um the offset stuff around the time that the direct market became kind of the major seller i was i was i was interesting to, i was talking with the people at king features so you know all your sunday comic sections are printed you know, usually several weeks ahead of time right? in various places around the country and then sorted together with your parade magazine and your TV guide and right. all your other stuff. And depending upon where you are in the country, I guess they still actually have some of those super ancient old yeah. Heidelberg four <laughs> plate color presses. And so the default, because this came out of my, uh, complaining about the, 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 the coloring. Right. Um, and they said, well, they have to default to what those old presses could do. Oh, wow. Well, you're you know? limited too, though. So I guess within the next couple of years. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just saying that, that um, so I color the Sunday myself and I color in Photoshop. They have a, a team of people at King that color like all their comics. So if you don't color it yourself, like I don't color the dailies, so they have somebody there. And so like the same person that's coloring Heathcliff is coloring your stuff, right? And <laughs> what, works, what works on Heathcliff doesn't work on something that's more realistic, right? right. But part of the part of that, and I remember when I first started, they gave me a little thing and said, you know. Don't use these colors. Use these colors. This color doesn't work well, which is probably because of the old press. If you had two hundred percent, that would be would actually right. be too much ink right. for the paper. The paper could not absorb right. that much ink. So it's it's funny that I think the newspaper strips might be the last gasp, as long as those those old Heidelberg presses are still. They haven't, you know pulled all the guy's fingers off yet he's still got <laughs> he's still got two left he can take the plates off my, my teacher in high school had a missing finger from getting it pulled off oh wow but what is the what would you say the the print run for a comic 
a Sunday comic page can't be really huge anymore. I mean, a Sunday papers, Sunday circulation is not going to be, I mean, what is it? Maybe in the thousands? It's not like a hundred thousand, is it? Oh, I would say easily. Yeah. I mean, look at the Washington Post has a Sunday section. Oh, okay. Um, but I was thinking you know, like a lot of the local papers can't be hitting those marks anymore. Not, maybe not all together. Yeah. Um, but still, but I would, I mean, that would be interesting. I would still imagine that in Philadelphia, you still had, 150,000 people buying the, yeah. the Inquirer. I mean, now more and more is going online. Yeah. Even like the digital thing. So like King Hester stuff, Seattle Time, all these people, all these newspapers uh, carry the stuff. Even if they don't carry them in the daily paper, you can actually go to their website and then watch it or see, look at it on, on the website. But yeah, so I was actually surprised because I, I would have figured everybody had gone over digital now you know you well, just... somebody got a good deal on those i mean there probably were two presses left and yeah. once the comic comic industry kind of abandoned it in what 90 it might have been like 1990 or 91 or something um somebody probably said hey this this still works <laughs> you know so um, so when you started did did somebody like your editors like you know like giordano or somebody say okay here kid Here's the five things you never do. You never do this. You never do that. You never, you know. No, I never got a, never got a, uh, no one said anything. I just basically drew what, um, I was inspired by like, you know, the Tom Palmer and, and Klaus Jansen. And uh, Palmer used to still do really fine lines, even though they wouldn't always print. Mm -hmm. And I realized what he was doing was when I was in, in high school, my art teacher would, always he would always stress to squint you know like if you're looking at, at a drawing or you're looking at a picture and squinting at it took the detail away but you could get like the sense of the overall sense of say like a design or shadows or whatever so i realized that palmer was inking with his same subtlety but if those you know 25 really thin lines that he drew as shading on thor or conan or something if you squinted at it it could fill in and become a black area and it wouldn't look terrible. So he was almost uh, working, you know, in a defense, in a, in a defensive way towards bad printing. And that's how I, I mean, I tried to do that too. I started out using a heavier line. And then when I started seeing some of the printed books, I at least got a sense of what happened. You know, I mean, we, I think you and I, Mike and I have talked about in the old days. And again, we're talking about ink absorbing into the paper. Well, there was like a certain quality, I think, that was kind of magical with a, a pen and ink page being transported to a comic book printing press. Is that the mm -hmm. thin lines would get thinner and maybe drop, but the thicker lines would get thicker. So it enhanced that thick to thin uh, rendering style just really subtly. And when they did, when they, when they went to offset, it just was just there like a Xerox. You know what I mean? It, was, it didn't have any extra oomph to it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the problems when the when the offset books, you know, with the coloring, too, is that I think a lot of people, if you looked at their color guides, it would probably have looked fine on newsprint. But then on the offset paper, it just sat there and, it, you know, you needed sunglasses because it was so bright. Yeah, it's funny because comics was always like the last man to to switch to the new technology right. it's like basically hey hey wait a minute I'm not, yeah there's no more wax they're not making wax for the wax there's no more film. there's no more film for that camp hey i was about to shoot a picture of the what what it's like it was always it was always that way and and i remember in 90 mid 90s when i bought my first computer i was still one of the first few people that i knew andy parks had one before me but I was still, there was a lot of guys I knew who did not buy. Right. Or they had a computer to talk on CompuServe, but they didn't have a computer to like do art and stuff. Yeah. Yet. Right. Because right. I think desktop publishing had jumped over right. several years before that. But comics was still, you know, uh, let's see. Let's mm -hmm. fix, uh, let's fix, let's fix that there. Yeah. I rubbed it down. Yeah. It looks good. <laughs> well, you, when, when I worked in commercial art for a couple of years, before I got into comics. And what amazed me when I first got my, 
the first page to ink and it was a splash page. It had the indicia cut in, you know, the all the legal stuff that was on the bottom of the first page. And the issue number was actually cut out from another stat and pasted over. So they had, they were pasting like a single letter or a single number hmm. onto these things. You know, if you ever did key line, it was called key line paste up. Yeah. For commercial art, you'd be creating the, the thing that was photographed that the plate was made from. And you would often cut type and, and you used to use a waxer to get the type and you'd burnish it down or whatever. But we would never do a number in the middle of a line. You would just do a new stat. Right, right. You know? So it, was, it just amazed, it amazed me at how cheap they were. The whole business was constructed economically. And if anybody or, uh, buys artwork from that era, if you buy original artwork and you wonder why the pages are cut on the corners, the pages will, they cut the corners of the artboard right to the border, like just to the border. And that was so that they could stack four pages together on the stat camera when they statted them for their, for the archive, for the library. It was just the ability to squeeze four comic pages onto the, you know, large uh, photostat machine, the, the flatbed mm -hmm. thing, which is just amazing that you would be cutting artwork you know but it was a no, it was, yeah it wasn't artwork to them it was something that you know was a means to an end well if right. you, also if you buy old artwork um you notice like how shitty their production was it would be <laughs> here i'm gonna put this little thing here and i'm gonna put a mound of rubber cement which yeah, will yeah. later permanently stain right the pages you'll you'll see. <laughs> right yeah so i have a lot of 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 uh, old art like that you'll buy and it was like even a lot of my dark hawk stuff the first several issues um there was a lot of paste up on the stuff some issues were lettered i'm sure you have the same with superman yeah. there's stuff that was lettered and then there's stuff that was on the board and then there's stuff that was lettered and then pasted down but yeah. who depended upon who was in right. the bullpen doing that production work you know well, they would like i have superman pages where or all star squadron too say an image was at when it got into the editorial office after it was inked someone said you know let's put a little more space between the balloons at the top so they would take and stat the panel you know and they would move the panel down but they would paste it over it was it's just crazy they would paste it over the original art yeah you know the whole panel would be pasted but then the art the your your art could be cut sometimes like you, uh, if you tried to peel it up you couldn't peel it up without it seeing cut marks or something. So, I mean, they just, it wasn't that they didn't care. It was a volume business and the art was an afterthought. Um, but it is funny. I mean, it's funny to think about the, we were talking about the, the process and how cheap they were. Um, that also really does, did apply to, I don't know if you remember when they first bought that, they first, DC first started doing computer color. They bought a system that was some company in Ireland and so it was a big, you know, old computer with a color screen. And it was a whole, it was a crazy thing. It had a gigantic keyboard and they had the colorist work in the office. And I think, um, I'm trying to remember the two, two colorists who mainly worked in there. Um, I'll think of the name, but they, it was this, you know, oh, this is the Holy Grail. It was this gigantic machine. I think I remember it cost like 40,000 bucks or something because it was a proprietary coloring process. And, uh, and all it did was it, it did exactly what the other stuff would do. You'd, you'd still have your Y2K or Y, you know, like you'd, you'd have Y2B2 or something to create a, a, a specific green or something. It used that, but it was just like almost like a key, key function. It just, it was crazy. But when I heard the cost of it, it was like, whoa. And a few years into that, computer costs started going down. And I think Steve Olaf was one of the, the, yeah. first guy, the mainstream color stuff. He did the Batman movie book, the adaptation. He colored that on a computer. That was one of the first DC things that was done. Not a specialty project, but a, as a mainstream thing on uh, on computer. But the, even around the time of the death of Superman, the first guy that I remember who took in, it into his own hands was Brett Breeding. Brett had... Uh, decided that he was going to learn how to color, and he bought a, you know, bought the new computer. He bought this, whatever the scanner and stuff, 
and he used to color the Superman covers around, I want to say it was during like post death of Superman. So the return of Superman, he was doing, you know, computer color and DC would give him the logos because they had no way of patching them in later. So wow. he would pull the trade dress into his file, copy it onto a giant SideQuest disc <laughs> and he would mail that FedEx, you know, but it was, I always gave him credit for learning it and doing it, but he was so far ahead of his time in that, case that it, it it was not cost effective for him because the, the color rate would, didn't go up for all the extra work even though he was doing the color separators you know the job of the housewives cutting film he was doing a lot of that extra work and it was still like the same color rate and he's mm -hmm. he gave up after maybe three or four uh, maybe more but he, he definitely gave up over uh, just out of frustration how much time it took yeah but, it's, uh, it's funny i mean that's that's the one thing i think that people in their first 10 years, maybe now of their, their current, the, this current era will find out in their second 20 years because technology will have made a big jump. Like even with storyboarding, one of the big differences now is that everybody uses storyboard pro well, the new versions of storyboard pro allow you to make animatics. So right. the big now, thing. right, right. And so they want you, as a storyboard right. person to make right. the animatic mm -hmm. because I used to, when I was working on Batman or, you know, all the other stuff, they would have somebody who would, you would send their board in and you had some board, you had to sit there and scan them all, right. put them in the system. And then they had a timer who would time your board out. Right. Now you can time it out yourself, but that's an extra job. Yeah. Yeah. But you yeah, do. Pay. They don't want, yeah, I'm sure they don't really want to pay you what, what they don't want to pay you what they would pay a timer. Right. Right. So that's one of the things that, that while technology is a really great thing, it, the companies can also push that back on you and say, well, also, and if you want to do this, are you good at timing? Have you had timing experience? You know, um, just like, you know, uh, we scan all of our stuff. We right. send all of our stuff, but that means we have to have all the technology yeah. do that, which, you know, every couple of years you have to go, well, I got to get the Adobe subscription. And, right. and, Adobe, and if Adobe tomorrow said it's $300 a month, everybody would be cursing them, but then they would be paying $300 a month. Because, yeah, because they'd have to. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, do you, I mean, when you, you think about the idea that somebody had to, DC or Marvel was paying FedEx bills or Airborne Express oh, yeah. later on. You think about how much cost savings it was that for that to just all be shifted onto the anchor, because it really the burden fell on the anchors. Yeah, I mean uh, the pencilers. It, you know, you weren't really no hardly anybody's inking on the boards. So the penciler scanning. You're still inking though on the boards, right? Well, I do my own. Yeah, but I'm saying like if you had an inker, penciler, inker combination at Marvel or DC, generally, I guess unless they made some special arrangement, you're you're going to be sending, you know, files for the inker to print out in blue line. So, um, but that whole sh there's a whole shift that happened that the creative part, the creative people took the brunt of. And the rates never, you know, the, the rates never went up to accommodate that, but the company saved a lot of money. Yeah, I think Marvel, FedEx, Marvel was FedEx's third biggest customer at one. Yeah, I could totally understand it. Think about how many packages were going out, maybe. With one page. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was at DC. At DC, remember, the, the DC was like you had to have at least five or six pages. Right, package, right, right. Which meant that you have to wait to get paid a little longer if you were just, you know, but uh, but yeah, I, I think Beatty, John Beatty was doing the, the book, The Nam, over Michael Golden. And I think that was the first, those are two firsts in that one. The, the, the first aspect of it was that he was sending FedEx packages with like a single page, which kind of blew my mind. But the other aspect was talking about instant comics. He was finishing a book and it was like printed, you know, like a, less than a month later. And that was during that, like you said, there was that like maybe a 10, 10 week or 12 week kind of uh, grace period. And this was like right to the, uh, the very cusp of the deadline, which, mm -hmm. you know, for anybody who works on a monthly book, um, it's stressful enough to make deadlines on a monthly 
but when you add extra stress into those things, it's just not fair. I mean, that, like whenever, when I was working and I was at the mercy of a, a writer's turning in script, it's frustrating to lose time because someone can say, well, here's a job to work on while you're waiting on that script. Mm -hmm. But then once you get that script, that deadline is, is late. So you either miss an issue at some point or you have to make it up. So mm -hmm. when I started writing stuff, I always want to make a point of making it easy as possible for whoever was coming after me, you know, the penciler, ink or whatever. So I always tried to get the, the lettering. I'd always type the script up the minute I got it. You know, on my fax machine, I would type it. It would go out to the letterer on a Friday night. Pages would go to the anchor by Monday. That's the way you had to work. So for anybody to screw up the... Well, no, the, that's not how you had to work. That's how you should work. Right. But the, <laughs> for anybody to screw up the deadline or to screw up that little, you know, chain that uh, was just in, unconscionable because I, I'd gone through it and it's no fun to have extra pressure on you, you know? Yeah. The people that probably lost the most work in the history of comics are probably the inkers and the colorists because you'd have to take pages and yeah. farm, farm, yeah, yeah. Them, farm them out, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, Marvel, Marvel, I think, again, was, was the first one that I'd heard of where they put, they would throw like, you know, eight inkers on an issue. And I was like, wow, that, I mean, it gets the job done, but what it does is it, turns every one of those anchors into an invisible cog. In other words, their name doesn't stand out if it's, you know, 10 M last hands. Names. M hands, I think sometimes it would be. There. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's it's a way to take you out of the business in a way while you're still working. Um, I know mm. I know people who worked like who were anchors during that, say the, I would say probably late 90s, early 2000s, where they were doing that a lot at Marvel. And one, one guy I knew was really busy. He was still making a regular living. But for all practical purposes, it looked like he dropped off the face of the earth because he didn't have his own title that he inked. You know, he was suddenly one of many. Yeah. And that's... Yeah, we, like, we've talked about that. We've talked about that. I, I think I, I learned very early on that if you were the fireman, they only call you when there's a fire. They never call you when there's a picnic. Right. Right. You, know, you know, you gotta you can stay in the firehouse and clean that machine. You're only gonna you're not gonna call you over for a piece of pie. We're only gonna call you when it's like a you know the, the third floor is burning and full of babies. We're gonna call you we're gonna call you then, you know. Go feed the Dalmatian. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey Jerry, I, I wanna get to some of these questions that are starting to fill up in the room. So uh and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh Jerry's a very special person. So uh, we'll start at the top here with our good buddy, J. Robert Deans, uh, J.R.D., as he's affectionately known on our podcast. Uh, J.R.D. asks, Jerry, how do you go about building pages when you're writing a book yourself versus working for another writer? And how much did that process have to change working on the Batman 89 adaptation? Thanks, um, J.R.D. I think the big difference, well, I mean, as far as building pages, like when you're when you're writing a page, I always thought of pacing, um, but a lot of times when you get a plot, for example, the plot would leave the pacing to you. It'd be just a long outline and you'd have to break it over 22 pages. So you'd have to look at it and find this fits on one page, this fits on one page, just, oh, this is a big thing. I can make this a splash or something. Um, so your brain, I think you just train yourself to think in that way. When I, when I did it for myself, when I was drawing, as opposed to writing maybe for somebody else, I still processed it the same way because I didn't want to push that burden on the, the penciler because um, I did feel it was a burden to make me take an outline and break it into 22 pages because nobody was paying me extra for that or even giving me credit for it. It's different like the Marvel way and, and at Marvel, you knew that's what happened like with Buscema, you know, in that later er era. Um, where they would just say, okay, here's a story about the Inhumans, they're on the moon, the bad guy attacks, and then it's Cliffhanger, and Busema or, you know, either, either of the Busemas or many of these people would just be able to break that into 20, 22 pages, and a writer could hang something on it that seemed interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that seemed like an unfair burden. But anyway, so like with the Batman movie book, that was written 
Denny O'Neill adapted the shooting script, um, which was by Sam Hamm. But then the shooting script was rewritten while they were shooting. I think even right before shooting, I think someone else, I forget the guy's name, but he rewrote a lot. So Denny, while we were first approaching the thing, it was like we needed to lock down that script, but it kept changing. And Denny did a couple of the edits and changes. Um, the first bunch he tried to adapt to and he re-scripted. And then we, Jonathan Peterson and I, Jonathan was the editor. He, he and I were like, does Denny want to be on call for the whole book? Because I said, if, if it's a case of him, you should just ask him if he wants to sign off and say, have fun, you know, um, I'm out. Because that would be fair yeah. too. It's not fair to keep having him rewrite stuff. So at, at a certain point, like once we were into the book, maybe the first 10 pages, Jonathan and I would just discuss whatever new script pages came in and we would try to fit some of it in. So it was kind of like stuffing extra potatoes into a sack that was already full of potatoes. <laughs> you couldn't really cut stuff, but you could add panels to try to reflect the, the movie. So that was kind of the movie thing was a really so did, weird. So did the book grow? Anomaly. Did the book get bigger because of that? No, it didn't. So they had a finite amount, 64 pages. So what happened was we would try to re reconfigure stuff and reuse dialogue that Denny had done if we could, or we would just plug in whatever the movie dialogue was. Um, so that wasn't like, that was totally not a normal comic script anyways, you know? Um, and again, we, we, no one wanted to offend, to offend Denny. So it was like, do you want to be part of this? Do you want to be revising and constantly? Because he's still working his day job and stuff. So, you know, we figured it was easier to for me and Jonathan to be on the phone at one in the morning than to expect Denny to be available. You know, because ah, <laughs> we were Page three is is three. Page three has to be redone again at four a.m. And, yeah. and I mean, I, I couldn't wait. Like in, in a lot of cases, the deadline was so strict that I couldn't wait for the next day to find out either. So a lot of times we did stuff. It would just be by phone late at night. And I knew Jonathan was up and I knew also knew that he had he would take home all the reference. So we had duplicate kind of reference, but he would take his stuff home in his briefcase so he could find the page or find the sequence and, and we'd work it out. But, How much uh, movie reference did you get when you were I working? A couple of film boxes of stills, but most of it was, I mean, it was, it was all valuable stuff, but most of it was from the beginning of the movie. Um, there was less on-set photography of scenes. Like they used to do, like if they had a scene that was being filmed, there was a set photographer who would shoot that for before it was, before the cameras rolled, he would shoot the setup a lot of times with the actor, you know, posing or something. Um, but they didn't do that as the movie got improvised, you know. So once you're about halfway through the movie, a lot of stuff changed. Mm. There were scenes that were just changed totally. Some stuff was thrown out. Um, it was an interesting project. I mean, you know, again, we had a deadline because the book had to be at the printer. The movie didn't hit theaters until June. The book had to be done and at the printer by April, like early April. Right. Yeah. So the movie guys had a couple of months there for fine tuning the special effects and stuff. We never saw a lot of that. We just had to make educated guess, or I had to make an educated guess. Yeah, I remember when uh, uh, Williamson did the Blade Runner adaption, and I think Archie worked on that with him and sent him. I mean, Al had stacks, giant stacks of stills, like every seemed like every scene right. of the film, which, uh, and then Brett worked on the Indiana Jones and there was stuff that he had and stuff that he didn't because right. the same thing, because there's some stuff that's going to be done at Pine Tree Studios, but then there's right. other stuff that's being done at ILM and nobody knows right. what that stuff looks like. Right. And right. I remember or there's those things. Someone, someone could change something and you would, you wouldn't really be privy to that. Uh, Jerry, Chris, our buddy Chris Bailey. You know Chris Bailey. Yes, I do. Chris, Chris Bailey Chris. said, "Was that Batman job? Was it kind of fun and exciting or a nightmare?" 
it was a nightmare. It was fun <laughs> afterwards. Oh no. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean it uh -huh. was it was just a really it was a hard deadline. Mm -hmm. It was exciting to be part of it, but it was it was just hard work. So, you know, you can't enjoy that while you're on that schedule. You just, all you can think about is having to do a page and get a page done each day. I mean, I had the rough layouts and it was lettered in, in advance, but then just to finish basically pencil and ink a page, pretty much one a day, because I didn't start it until I, I really, for the most part, I had February and March. So those were my two months to do 64 pages. That's a lot. I mean, I was never just like sit down right. and go. That's like go. Yeah. That's, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I didn't sleep much. I worked seven days a week and I still had to do two covers. I had to do a painted cover for it. And I had to do a, a line art cover in the midst of all that. And uh, but it was exciting. I mean, it's like the crisis stuff, too. You know, you're in the midst of that whirlwind. And it's exciting to be involved in something like that, but it's more gratifying to be done with it and you know, when Jonathan and I got to see the, the movie, we both at the end, each different scenes that we were like kind of like crossing our fingers that we got right. We'd look at each other and we'd do the thumbs up, <laughs> you know, and that was the satisfaction that we guessed right on something, you know. Now, when you're working, uh, uh, I know when you're working on uh, things where you have to do the likeness of people, you, you also want to have like stills of the people's heads from from the side yeah, or, or like yeah, from the three that. quarter back. Cause yeah. it's like, what does that look like? You know? And then it's like right. dark cause it's a dark film. Right. right? So right. you're trying to figure out. Well, you, it, you couldn't do like, no one's paying Jack, Jack Nicholson to see him from behind the ear. Right. But right. It's a, comic book, <laughs> it's a comic book angle that you need because you're also compressing what's on screen that runs five minutes by doing the back of a guy's head and the front of another guy's head. And then you reverse it. So if you if I go through the stills and I could mostly there were long shots of somebody walking and I would try to see, OK, can I use that? And then I would use like a three quarter back view. I would reuse them because there weren't a lot of them, but it's all part of the mechanics of, of compressing for a comic book. Right. Is that you need that because you can have a conversation of like, say, three or four balloons, you know, that can maybe take up a couple of minutes of screen time. But you need to stage, like I said, this guy in the foreground, that guy here. In movies, it's always there's Nicholson straight on, then they cut to Keaton straight right. on. You know, not right. that many. Or if they do a two shot, it's like them side by side, side you know, side views or whatever. And comic books, you need different angles. You need high angles looking down. You need low angles because that's all part of the making a page exciting. Yeah, I was just wondering if you got that because I was just. Uh, I'm yeah, always... no, there was a lot of that. You had to just kind of wing it. Yeah, yeah, because I remember uh, when Brett was doing uh, Raiders, and Harrison Ford is a hard guy to draw because yeah. he's not symmetrical. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and you know, Al was really good at at sort of cutting down the middle of looking at the reference because right. his, his stuff doesn't exactly look like Harrison Ford, but you know right. that's Han Solo, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, but here sure. you're trying to draw Jack Nicholson and Michael right. Keaton. Right. I mean, but you, in that case, that was on me because I, Jonathan and I agreed early on. It's like we wanted it to look like the movie. It was the right move, but you can kind of see why they don't do it now. Number one, a lot of the actors won't give likeness approvals because they're smart, you know. Mm -hmm. But back then, they had we had to just get we had to get Keaton, we had to get Nicholson and Kim Basinger. The other people were all like, you know, they probably signed away their likenesses when they'd signed their contracts. But those, the other best thing that Jonathan did, he said, because he had, he had edited in the Star Trek comics, he was like assistant editor or, or editor. And he said, you don't want to have to submit the stuff for likeness approval page by page because they'll just eat up time. We don't have time. We don't want to have to redo stuff. So We'll, we'll propose it, we'll do an audition page for each actor, and they sign off, and that means that they trust me to make them look good for the whole thing. And that, we couldn't have done it on the deadline without having that kind of blanket, you know, in advance likeness approval. And I had to yeah. do Nicholson twice. I did have to go back and do it, but I didn't have much reference when I did it the first time, because it was before, it was probably in January that I drew him, and mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't a lot of stuff out there. 
There's my phone. <laughs> we'll just let did, the machine get it. <laughs> did did uh? So he had to approve your drawings. Did he change stuff? He didn't like the like. It was they went to the to the agent or something, and um, I think they're in the the Batman. No, they didn't use it. They're in like uh, back issue did a Batman movie special out last June. And they printed those um, the audition things. But I did one with him as the Joker, one with him as just Jack Napier. And I was pulling from movie magazines and stuff. So it was kind of generic E Jack Nicholson. And he was, they were supposed to just go to the agent and the agent had a sign off on it. But then there was also notes on the stat that said, this doesn't look like my nose at all. And I'm like, well, the agent's not going to say that. It had to be Nicholson. <laughs> <laughs> I still have those, but they're not autographed. But I know it's his. It's him. You know. That's great. He, didn't like, he was very particular about the way his nose was drawn, um, and uh, I I just redid them, and he then he, he approved. So it was it was all good. But the Keaton ones went. Those were fine. Kim Basinger, though, no problem with those either. So it was just kind of funny. But you know, like you were saying about Harrison Ford. If you look at actors, a lot of times, or any kind of like celebrity, if you have to draw somebody regularly or more than once, like in a comic, you'll note that somebody can look entirely differently from one side versus the other. And like with Harrison Ford, no doubt, because his face is a little bit lopsided or whatever, his features aren't like symmetrical. Mm -hmm. You can get angles and you can understand why they wouldn't want like, oh, this is my best side, or there's never a three quarter view from the left or something right. like that. Because when you finally find one, say in a People magazine or something has a picture, of you look at it and you go, well, you know, that doesn't even look like him. <laughs> so uh, yeah. it's all about that image. Unless you're Robert Redford, who has a perfectly symmetrical face. He's mm -hmm. one of those that true? Right. Yeah. yeah. There's certain people that are like that. I think like Brad Pitt. There, were, I saw an article about that. And they had people where if you, it's like if you took two so halves of Harrison Ford, yeah, yeah. It would be like, whoa, who's that? They yeah, yeah. wouldn't line up, right? Yeah. yeah. But there's certain yeah. actors who have that thing where their faces are very symmetrical. I remember seeing they had a they put a line through t young Tom Cruise's face <laughs> and he was smiling and they showed just how off a line his teeth are. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, his like teeth are like oh <laughs> the back of his skull. Uh, well, I have another I have another question for you, Jerry. This is from uh, Alex Neal. Alex wants to know do you have any favorite novels you'd like to adapt? to comics i always thought it'd be cool to do the shining hmm. but then i my favorite stephen king was always um salem's lot mm -hmm. and i always thought salem's lot would have been a really fun one to do but they weren't doing them back then you know what i mean like back when it in the time when i could have maybe gotten something like that stephen king wasn't doing kind of comic adaptations yeah but, Beyond that, I always, you know, I really like the, um, I like Raymond Chandler a lot. Um, I think it would be fun to try to do one of the, you know, not the big sleep or, but, you know, there were a bunch of different ones that maybe didn't get adapted to movies that would be fun. Um, those are the type of things I think of. I don't really think of science fiction. I always mm -hmm. think of stuff that would be, uh, you know, like a real, real setting or a period setting or something would be kind of fun. I think Doc Savage would be fun to do in a period setting. You know what I mean? Forget about all the trying to make them relevant or updated or whatever. You could certainly do something like that and do what they, like Dave Stevens, the Rocketeer, the whole, <clears throat> the Rocketeer as a, as a creation is great, but it's not stupendous. It's, it's the, what he did with it. You know, he, mm -hmm. he painted that Los Angeles of the time, the time period so perfectly that that's the appeal of it. It's that nostalgic appeal of like, wow, this, you know, the, the airfields and all that stuff. So I think um, there's always that there's an appeal to doing something like that and to, to get, get an era right in the same way as getting a caricature or getting a, you know, a likeness right. It, uh, it kind of sells the project or gives it maybe even more weight than it would have normally. You know, but you, you like, sense. you like doing, you like doing, um, uh, and that's what, one thing I always notice about your work, right? You like doing environments. Environments yeah. are an important part of your work. Like some guys just love doing the figure, and they'll occasionally stick. Like even Basema, as great as he was, you yeah. could tell he never loved the environments as much as he loved yeah. the figures. Well, see, I, I think 
I mean, I was going to say, like, with, with a guy like Busema, his he seemed to, and maybe I'm wrong, but from everything I've read about it, it seemed like he had sketchbooks and he did all those sketches on the back. He was always drawing. And I think that he was always drawing figure stuff for the most part. Yeah. I think, I think for me, I like seeing a character in in a setting because if you put them in a setting, it makes it more convincing and more believable. If the setting is somehow solid, you know, I don't think my, my figure work is, is not as dynamic, but I think if I can put a figure into some background that you buy, that you'll go, oh yeah, that's, you know, that looks real or that looks, you know, like 1955 or something like that. I think that's the appeal. Um, I, I'm fascinated by the, the styles more, more so than hairstyles or clothing styles. I like the idea of, of how cars have changed and yet a lot of buildings haven't, you know? I mean, you could still film probably on the streets of Los Angeles and convincingly make something into 1930 by eliminating a couple things. You know, not everywhere, but there's certain buildings that are still around. Same with New York. Yeah. You can find little corners where it's timeless with the exception of cell towers or some other, you know, small detail. Yeah, South Philly is like that too. You, there's places in Philly that you could go and film and it would look just pretty, and except for the light poles and you know right. things like that, yeah. Mailbox, the five G, the five yeah. G hub, five G yeah. controlling you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, I noticed that right away. Um, that's one of the things I always liked about your your uh, Superman, and you could see that even with guys, you know, that we grew up admiring, people like Kurt Swan or or Neil Adams. They to them. They brought that. I think Mike froze. Oh. Um, hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick him out and bring him back in. Hold on a second. Oh, Mike, no! All right, we'll try to get him <laughs> back. Oh, here he is. I'm back. All right, go ahead, Mike. I was just saying that it. Um, the guys you grew up admiring, like if you read a Kurt Swan Superman comic, you felt like it was a real place. Yeah. You know, and what I find ironic is that in comics going into movies and catching up um, with all the technology, that's sort of reimposed, it's sort of reimposed on comics this sense of realism of guys like tracing photographs for backgrounds and stuff, but it doesn't seem as believable to me. It looks like yeah. it looks more fake. If you do a drawing of Superman flying right. and then you go just trace the empire state building behind right. it, it just doesn't. Yeah. yeah. Well, here's a question. You, you worked in commercial art, right? Yeah. Mike. Yeah. There were guys that, that I worked with who were like the pros. I was like an apprentice guy. But they would take photographs, and I, I would often, because I was like the young guy, I would often have to pose for these Polaroids of the guy <laughs> driving a tractor or something. You know, you'd just be sitting on a table pretending to hold a steering wheel. <laughs> um, but anyways, a lot of a lot of that is is what I think some has happened with certain comics. Not all, but I think it, it's the easy access to a digital photo, and suddenly you're taking a picture of your friend who's supposed to be spider-man and he looks kind of schlumpy rather than idealized because you're you're kind of wedded to the idea of using that reference so you can get a little more a little more realism but then you lose the the bigness and that's what mm. i think kurt swan even though he wasn't tremendously dynamic he still gave it the right comic book uh 10 beyond reality you know you can draw clip art of a guy standing and trace it out of one of the Fairburn books and throw it onto a comic book background, but it's there's still going to be a little disconnect unless you can do something with it, you know? I mean, you used to, we used to hear that. Well, I, that's what I remember from reading some of the, I guess it was like, I'm trying to remember if it was the Hogarth stuff. Um, I know Hogarth's not well <laughs> received by you. <laughs> but I'm trying to remember where, I, re I, I remember reading that you shouldn't take a, that you shouldn't take a photograph and trace it dead because basically human beings aren't ideally proportioned. Even if you're, you know, six foot, I'm, I was six, two, 
you know, I have my torso maybe is too long or my legs are longer. It's not like a, a perfect proportion. So when you trace something from a photograph, you're also getting the angle that this, the camera angle is distorting something. And a lot of times people don't correct that. So yeah. that was the lesson I was like, use your reference to guide you, but don't be married to it. You yeah. know, um, I always would come up with the pose first and it's like, ask backwards way of doing it but i would draw the pose and then i would go searching through the fairburn books for like the anatomy something that would help me fill out the anatomy on a figure or the folds on a, a coat or something but i think that kind of helped me make it my own thing rather i think than that's the way the older generation of guys were taught to to use it um nobody could afford polaroids i mean you couldn't really afford to take right well even if you right eight for developing yeah. Well, even if you did, because um, there's Steve Holland, the most used right. male. I mean, there's probably 10 million <laughs> pictures of that guy on thousands and thousands and thousands of paperbacks, right? Right. Um, and he's like Doc Savage, and then he's like a bad guy. I saw right. uh, I saw off of Heritage, there was a Western cover where he was all five guys. He was uh, the good right. guys and the, <laughs> and right. the bad guys. But he has a very particular build that right. you could see that James Obama took and like said, yeah, but you're a little bit, you know, right. uh, there, there you go, Doc Savage. Right. Um, and I learned that also from Al because Al would show me how to trace a photo and turn the photo into the drawing. And he had that way of having practice to know like people's in general, people's necks are too short. Right. Right. Uh, women's necks are too short. So you, just you, you would slightly elongate it or you would go, I know when I trace this also, I'm going around, I might tend to make it fatter. You make the heads fatter. Right, right. You're going on the out, the outside of the outline rather than... Yeah, so there's all these little things that you learn if you're using the projector as opposed to, draw, to what you're doing, which right. is you draw the pose and then you try to find the information to make it convincing. Right. The drapery, right. the lighting, right. whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was the way it was taught, I believe, in the like the 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 old school way it was taught. Is that the camera was uh, was it was an aid. It was not right. the beginning and the end. Right, right. And that is something that I think that's almost completely lost now because nobody really teaches how to use. Reference. They just go put it, right. put it in your background on your in Clip Studio, and then right. it, go right over the top of it. I'm amazed mm -hmm. at the amount of of. I would imagine a lot of people just direct swipe off of a Google image or whatever. Oh yeah. And I keep thinking at some point, you know, it's still the most of these are most images are somebody's image. You know, I mean, I I always felt like you were supposed to fix it or change it somehow so that it wasn't immediately identifiable like right. i always felt like you're going to get in trouble or something mm -hmm. um and you technically can you know i mean if you well, using... would be harder what you would have to do well there's a guy uh that got sued for using the you the the photo of obama for the poster oh right right because oh, he, right? yeah, he didn't really change it now from what i remember reading about this you have to change it more than 30%. Oh, okay. All right. And um, it's different if you and I were to take a draw, uh, uh, a lady standing there doing this. Right. And right. you're going to put a gun in her hand. You're going to change the hands and the right. hair. Right. And you're going to redraw her face. Now, you might get the guts of the pose, but right. it's not the same as like stealing from 123.com right, right. and just plopping it right on there now there are some things that would be so specific but i can tell you i've gotten very good at being able to take a head from something and an arm from something else if i have right. especially on yeah. stuff like like judge parker not really yeah. ever on the phantom because i draw the phantom all by yeah. hand oh unless i use a car and then right. i'll just find a picture of a car and there's a bajillion right. pictures of any car so it would really be hard for anyone to go hey wait a minute that's your that's my three-quarter rear view picture of a bmw 
19, uh, the 2019 convertible because there's like, I was going to say, do you remember, you know, who Bernie Fuchs is, I'm pretty yeah. sure it was Bernie Fuchs at this. I, in 1980, when I was still at the commercial arts studio and I was starting to get DC work, I made a trip to New York to go to the, um, illustrators workshop. It was Bob Peake, Bernie Fuchs, Mark English, and Fred, to Fred Otnes or something. And there was maybe one other guy who can't remember, but they, they would do like a, a weekend seminar kind of thing. They would review your, you know, your work. They would, uh, you would go to little presentations and like Bob Peake talking about how he did his paintings. And they were talking about, I thought it was Bernie Fuchs was talking about this, but he was doing those Sports Illustrated things. And he did like the U.S. Open or one of these things where he had, Sports Illustrated would actually fly them in to these events and he would take his own pictures, his own reference. And he took, you know, whatever. He took shots of crowds and stuff. And then he did like a spread in the magazine. Right. And he had these people in there. And one guy in the crowd, he had him drinking a beer. And this guy apparently sued Sports Illustrated and him by because he was a teetotaler and he was recognizable, even though Bernie Fuchs did his thing with it. <laughs> he knew where he was, where he was standing. He knew. Wow. Where he was standing. And, and I, it was just funny because I, as I recall, and I, again, I'm a hundred percent sure it was Bernie Fuchs, but someone will correct me. But I remember like Bob, Bob Peak was telling the story and he said that right up until the end, they were discussing whether one of them would just, pose in that same thing so that when he'd go to court he'd say i didn't use that guy look here's the picture of the reference i used but he couldn't do it because he felt that was dishonest and he didn't want to lie on the stand or something wow i just always thought that was funny but that that you know when you think about it uh, sports illustrated was a had a gigantic circulation and even though you're taking your own photos you're not really getting the you know the permission from everybody in that crowd to draw them so, you know, the, the concept was there even back then that someone could maybe have a problem. But in this case, it was because the guy was a non-drinker that he had him, he like, whatever he changed about it, he had him holding a beer or something. It was just funny. Um, wow. He had him drinking an, an Arnold Palmer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Um, but it's just funny, the idea that they, that they were, they could have easily covered it by taking another picture and saying, no, no, here's the one I used. I didn't even use that guy. Here's the mm. one I used, but he was too honest to do it. So I think that, like Sports Illustrated, had to pay out some small amount to this guy just to make it go away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that that's that's something that I have talked to students about um, how to use swipe, how to use you know how to use photographs. Um, nobody really ever. I don't remember anybody ever at Marvel or DC or anybody ever worked with telling me like don't do this you just kind of like knew that you were not supposed to copy something although everybody was always copying stuff everybody yeah. was always using reference and i think now isn't it like you can't use a empire state building or certain well, land yeah, the building's a trademark but it's even um when i was doing all-star squadron i was drawing fdr winston churchill yeah i was churchill looked famous i mean he looked like himself in the like the very, very famous shot where he's kind of scowling because the photographer took a cigar away right before he took it. <laughs> um, I use those pictures from like the time, you know, time ink, uh, hard covers, the fabulous century. So I'd find stuff, never a problem. At some point in the mid eighties, I think Roy Thomas had some image in a comic. One of his comics was going to be Albert Einstein. And at that point, DC legal had to kick it and make him change it because Einstein's, likeness had been trademarked and and it was for licensing and you'd see einstein would show up just like mo howard in some ad for <laughs> watch or something <laughs> so anyways you flash forward i did red menace in maybe it's got to be 10 11 years ago it was set in the 50s and it was the mccarthy era so i had to draw drum joe mccarthy and had to draw um uh i'm trying to think of the roy Cohn who was like the lawyer, you know, yeah. the aide to McCarthy and Roy Cohen ultimately in the book is the bad guy. So he's a major character. And DC Wildstorm legal told me, they gave me parameters. They said, you cannot draw, you cannot base any one headshot on a single photograph. 
you're supposed to base it on multiple photographs. So it's not identifiable from any presumably copyrighted picture that would have been in, because that's all you have. You have archives of newspapers or magazines. Right. They're all technically copyrighted. And that was like weird because I'm going, well, I have to draw like Roy Cohn a lot because he's a major character. I had to draw McCarthy a bunch of times, not through the whole book, but it made it hard to do those likenesses. So what I had to do was I had to pull out my sketchbook and I had to grab all these photographs and collect, like I did it printed out like a 20 shots of Roy Cohn from all different angles. And I just started sketching him to the point where I could do like a shorthand version of him that wasn't based on any specific picture, but that was gen generically looked like him. Hmm. It's just crazy. I mean, it, I understand it totally because it, all the companies have kind of like, uh, Everybody's lawyered up now. And they've looking, all lawyered up, and they're all, all looking like, oh. everything's protected. Um, I mean, we couldn't use any kind of brands in anything. You can't draw Coca-Cola. You can't draw any any brand because that's a no-no. And can't smoke a lucky reflect, strike. <laughs> but I mean, it's hard to reflect reality of any kind of era that you're trying to sell if you can't draw. Pepsi Cola or Coca Cola or something that ties it to to that time frame, but you're not unless allowed to unless they're movies because then the, they're they're well, like they yeah, yeah yeah right they pay for the but but I mean it's like you you you're drawing stuff and you're forced to make something generic that you know would sell better as a specific thing so can't draw uh, B seventeen Boeing's gonna sue you get a draw seventeen and a half. <laughs> yeah, the Boeing sixteen point five. Uh, Jerry, how you feeling? I'm fine. You good? Okay. Um, I have some more questions. Uh, they're kind of stacked up. Um, break that ammonia. Right. Oh, I gotta break the. <laughs> get those smell. Of, get the smell of salts going. Uh, so I had an interesting question. This is like a sidebar question from our friend Qtagama who asks, Jerry, what's your opinion on the creator of Alan Scott, Martin Nodell? Oh, I, uh, I used to meet C. Marty at the, and his wife um, at the show at the Chicago cons and, and San Diego various shows. He was really, they're both really nice. Um, I, just to be friendly with them. I actually inked him on uh, the cover to like one of the DC's, what do they call them? Archives, the Green mm -hmm. Golden Age Green Lantern archive. I inked the, a drawing of his for a cover, and uh, he was he was a nice guy. I was glad that he, you know, and especially guys like that that kind of faded out of comics into other things. He was kind of forgotten for a long time, and I think by virtue of doing shows, he reinforced that hey, I was there at the beginning of Green Lantern, you know. So mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, he was proactive in kind of like staking a claim before he died. So I think DC, you know, certainly was able to pay him. They paid him. I know they paid him royalties on say the archive books and stuff. Um, but he was nice. He was a nice guy. His, I forget his wife's name. I think that maybe they had a daughter that also used to come to shows in the later years, but, uh, hmm. but he was a good guy. I, I always like, I mean, I, I grew up with my mom's tavern had all old retired guys. And that was, it's always comfortable with that you know, uh, older generation. Um, cause these guys all had stories and, and Nodell had stories. He wasn't as much of a, uh, storyteller as Jerry Robinson. Um, uh, Jerry Robinson had, had great, great stories about the early days of comics stuff that you would, maybe you'd see part of it in the history of comics, but then you'd get like the more X-rated, <laughs> not X-rated, but you get more adult stuff. Yeah. Like, oh, Oh. The unabridged version. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's like the unofficial history of comics or the untold history of comics. <laughs> uh, so, okay. Next, uh, Alex Neal has another question. Jerry, are there any chances of getting an artist edition of your work? And do you have any favorite artist editions yourself? Um, I really like the... I, I, I have a bunch of them in here. I have them sitting behind me, but... I like the uh, Wally Wood uh, EC one was really great. Um, it's oversized. The Storenko uh, Shield ones are nice. The Simonson, uh, I think I have the 
Simonson and Thor one. I like seeing that stuff. Um, I've tried to get artist editions. I mean, I, I've lobbied whoever had the rights to, and you know, nothing ever happened. The best, closest is the Batman movie adaptation, which um, I think I pitched it to DC after they already had the hardcover in mind, and mm-hmm. then they wound up printing it, not artwork size, but they did print the artwork and then the printed page side by side, which was kind of fun. Um, I like the idea of it because you really don't, you know, I mean, you don't really get to see behind the curtain. A lot of times now you have to buy artwork to do it or, you you know, Two Moros does a lot of that stuff. The Kirby collector was a great resource to see those, oh, yeah. you know, preserved Kirby pencils and stuff. But uh, what was the first piece of original art that you bought? Oh, I could. Did you did you would did you and did you buy it to learn from or did you buy it because you liked the art? I got a perfect. I have a perfect answer to that one, and it was apparently it was a stolen cash from DC. It was artwork that got stolen. I think in um, this would have been in nineteen seventy two, three. Four. Well, maybe yeah, somewhere in that seventy two to seventy three four. Probably you're right, seventy two seventy three, and. Weirdly enough, this place that I used to go that had old comics, it wasn't a comic store then, it was just a secondhand store. The word spread, hey, the guy who runs the store is getting a whole bunch of, of comic book artwork. And I'm like, how's that happen? So I show up on a Saturday and there's all these pages. And basically they got what would be considered the B pages. And it was all good stuff, but it was like there was a lot of Gil Kane, there was a lot of the Irv Novik, Dick Giordano, Bob Brown. It was that type of stuff. There was no Neil Adams. There was, you know, I mean, all the that had been picked. That stuff right? had been taken out. But uh, so I'm looking through, and I Captain Action was one of my favorite toys as a kid, and I liked mm-hmm. the comic. And Gil Kane had drawn the comic after issue one. He'd started with two and stuff. So I find a Captain Action page, and apparently the whole issue was there. I didn't realize this, but it was. I don't even know what issue it was an issue that that. Gil Kane inked himself. And this okay. fact, it, it fascinated me because I had little clue at that time about how the tools worked and how big pages were supposed to be or how you work. You know, I mean, I, I knew nothing. I just knew that printed comic size. So I, I grabbed this one page as I'm going through and my eye immediately went to a spot with whiteout. And the whiteout had to be like an eighth of an inch thick. <laughs> it was like a big bump. That he covered mm. and it was like when you you know is that old snowpake stuff right if it, if it clumped up and you ran that brush you'd get like a big lump and it would dry as a big lump and gill fixed the you know inked over it but it's like you know a topographical map or something <laughs> <laughs> so i bought this page and the main reason i bought the page besides liking captain action the main reason was because of the mistake because i thought wow that takes a lot of pressure off of me. I thought that the artwork page had to be perfect because I didn't know what original artwork, you know what I mean? I thought it had to look perfect. It couldn't have any mistakes, couldn't have any any errors on it. And it was comforting to know that a professional comic page could look like it had a have lot of mistakes. bumps on it. Could have bumps on yeah. it. <laughs> it had, I, swear, I still have the page. Now, years later, I was sharing a studio. I, I invited Al Bay, who had just started in comics. I invited Al as one of like four guys. So Al came in to round out the group and make the rent drop. And one day Al and I were talking about comics and about original art. And I was telling him the story about Gil Kane with the, you know, eighth inch thick whiteout. And he goes, you son of a... And I'm like, what, what? And he goes... You bought that page. And I said, yeah, I got it. It cost me like 15 bucks. And he goes, I have every other page of that issue. He said, when I bought it, I said, what idiot bought one of these pages? (laughs) And I still have it. I never sold it. I never gave it to him. (laughs) Every time it comes over, you're just like, oh, look what I (laughs) It was just funny. Like, you know. Uh, the gift that keeps giving. <laughs> it was just funny that, to know that years later he would find out that I was the guy who annoyed him so much because I broke up a whole issue. I didn't realize there was a whole issue and I couldn't have afforded it as a kid anyways, but 
you know, Al was a little older than me and he had been working for a while and he had like savings. So he obviously had money to money to burn on our artwork. Wow. <laughs> think think so of a $15, $15 Gil Kane page. I know. Oh. Well, I bought a, I bought a, at a Chicago con in maybe even that 1980, I think it could have been that year that I got the, the DC work since I live a drive away. I was kind of local to the show on fr Sunday late afternoon as the show was wrapping up you could get good deals because art dealers or anybody didn't want to have to pack it up and take it home so i remember going through some pages and i bought a tom palmer inking john Buscema page from conan it was an wow. unusual that they ink conan and this page has like 10 panels on it and again the appeal was that there was so much story in that one page you know, it was still dynamic, but it was there was so much story. There's Conan, he's running, there's a bull, he's jumping and grabbing the bull's horns, you know, he's flipping the bull over. All this happens on a single page, and Palmer did a beautiful job, super fine line, you know, rendering and stuff. It was just uh it was like a learning page. And that's what I would do when I'd look for art, even into the nineties when I was still buying art, I would look for a page that appealed to me as an artist and not as a comic fan or a collector. I bought a Joe Kubert page at a Chicago con in maybe 98, one of the oversized old um, Our Fighting Forces page that Kubert mm -hmm. did with the page is boring. For the most part, it's, it's a guy with the field telephone, but he used grease pencil. He used like grease pencil to render this phone in like multiple panels. And I said, wow, that's just beautiful. I mean, it's a, a beautiful technique page. So, you know. That's what appealed to me. I mean, I, I I have a couple pages in my collection of good, you know, full figure splashes and things like that. But a lot of them are stuff that I thought I could learn from this or, wow, what a cool trick. I mean, I have a Wally Wood page from um, uh, Picto Fiction. It was not published. It was the, the last stuff that EC tried to do. They were going to do as a magazine. Right. It had it was going to have copy copy blocks with illustrated pages. And this Wally Wood page that I bought, um, probably from Mitch Itkowitz, because I think he, I think he was selling a lot of those EC things. The page has duo shade, it has regular zipatone, it has stipple board, it has white zipatone. It's like every known tone to man is on this one page. Big panel cut in. Here's you know the duo shade, and then there's zipatone on top of it, and it's crazy, and it's a cool looking you know, uh, oddball page, but it was just, it's all technique, you know, is it, is it, was it heavy? Is it heavy to the, to the touch? Yeah. Those, because With it's, all that these stuff. Were, the picto fiction were magazine size, like mad magazine wound up being. So their the yeah. proportion is gigantic mm -hmm. and they, you know, the boards are all lined out like they would for the letterer. They were just blue lined with letter, the lettering guide across the mm -hmm. whole thing which had to be annoying to draw on, but, uh, mm -hmm. but just having the big panel, like I said, and you have to cut in the, you'd have to cut in the duo shade into that main page and then mm -hmm. cut in the area that had the stipple board or the, the coquille board. It was just crazy to, to, to see that. And I said, well, that, that obviously has my name on it. <laughs> I have to buy yeah. it. Yeah. I want, I mean, I wonder the, the interesting thing is, is um, younger artists who are getting into it now, if you're not buying, because I did the same thing, I would buy originals to learn from. But if people are doing digital stuff, then you're not really looking at the, because there really was a learning curve to actually look, oh, this yeah. is this is a pen. You can feel that this is a pen, that this was a brush. That, right. You could tell the difference between the how a pen worked on the paper and a brush worked on the paper because you'd always, everybody had to erase afterwards. So a pen mm -hmm. line would, would hold up to erasing. A brush line might kind of fade a little bit. And some people use thin ink. Some people use really dense ink. Yeah. Like it's always surprising to see how thin Frazetta's ink was. Oh, yeah. His ink but was very, he, very thin. He was also, I mean, he was doing some pretty fine lines. You know, I mean, the, the, the type of feathering he did, I would think that, you know, maybe that's how he accomplished it or something. Because there's, it's almost... It's so the transitions can be so smooth that they're almost impossible to try to recreate. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was very, um, but but that's the kind of thing that, like, if you're studying the digital stuff, which everybody's using, 
Yeah. You don't really get that. There's no artifact to see and go, oh, like the right. Gil Kane. Right. Of, of, right. Of it's, it's not at all a tactile experience, obviously. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you're also, besides not ever seeing an original page, you can only guess how somebody did it, you know? And I know from seeing how, like, some of the art programs work, you can, you know, make custom brushes and you can play around with stuff, but uh, you have don't you really get a sense of how it happens. Have you done any digital stuff yet? Are you playing around with that all? I played all? around with it. I just don't like it. I mean, I do more, I'll use digital probably more for layout stuff. Um, like if I'm going to print a blue line out or something, but just generally, like I just, I'm working on a commission. I mean, I still work this way. That's how I do like a little prelim because, you know, I'm going to blow it up and light box it because I don't like to give somebody a, a commission on, on a blue line if I'm drawing it, if I'm, you know, doing it myself. So I just light box it. Um, but I still like working that way. I mean, it feels um, it feels like that's what people are buying as well. You know what I mean? They want kind of the uh, uh, old timey experience. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that there, I, I'm predicting that there will at some point within the next 15 or 20 years that there will be a big backlash, maybe sooner, because I think because everything is going digital. Yeah. I think also because there's more stuff probably because of the pandemic thing, right? Like just somebody said something the other day about like what people like to do is go to a convention and they want you to sign their book. Right. Or you to do a drawing and they actually like to see you doing the sketch right before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Well, you know, until conventions come back or if they come back or whatever, that's actually, that's gone now. Yeah. And so there's a certain era now yeah. Uh, we'll have pro pre COVID, right? right. Post COVID, yeah. right? And then even like you're saying, like a lot of jobs you might do now. Uh, now I'm sure people would probably prefer if you're going to ink their stuff to send it to you because they want to have a couple of the pages themselves with right. your inks on it. But right. I don't think that that crosses the border with every artist now. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. Um, well, and again, you could, I, I understand that too, because obviously if I was, you know, if, if it were like the eighties and someone said, you know, I'm making a Wayne boring Superman origin, I kind of want to ink Wayne boring. I don't want to ink a blue line. And the same is true of a Kirby thing. You know, I mean, I got to ink Kirby for that Phantom, Phantom force. And I think I did a total of, I want to say like maybe three or four pages per issue. But the first issue had two pages of actual Kirby pencils and then two pages that had been restored to pencil by Keith Giffen that had been inked by Michael Thibodeau or something. Right. Or something else. So the, the Giffen ones are like faux Kirby, you know, but the, the actual on the boards, Kirby pages were drawn probably in the 70s. They were from a, a Bruce Lee comic he had proposed. So mm. they just adapted that to, to the to whatever he was doing, but it was a Bruce Lee comic, and it was drawn kind of in '70s, kind of prime Kirby. There's no way to replicate that by doing it on Blue Line. There's no way, you know. I mean, you're working on something that this guy touched. Is just a cool kind of. I mean, it's hard to describe it. I guess musicians would go through that if they're jamming with you know, some famous musician or someone that they really, you know, admired or whatever. But that was, for me, it was the same thing. Ink and Gil Kane or Ink and, um, you know, Wayne yeah. Boring, any of those guys, there's an added element of knowing that you're touching the same piece of work that some guy who's, you, you know, touched God's and, pants. You touched yeah. God's pants. Yeah. It's actually, mm -hmm. it is pretty amazing, you know. That's how I felt when I inked Kane on, uh, you know, the Shazam stuff, yeah, yeah. I felt like, okay, now I'm actually in comic books. <laughs> right. It, it feels, I'm making Gil right. Kane. Yeah. The, fir the first job I did for DC in, in 1980, the first thing they sent me was, I think it was an, I want to say a seven or eight page, could have been longer, maybe eight pages, Carmine Infantino. Oh, yeah. You posted something. 1980. Yeah. And it was like, 
it was great that I wasn't like a huge Infantino fan because I wasn't a DC fan completely. So if they had sent me any Marvel guy, I think I would have been, I would have froze. But because it was, it was Carmine, even though I respected the fact that this guy had history and he was a talented guy, I kind of felt a little bit detached enough to be able to do something with it and not, you know, feel uh, either like I was going to trace the pencils. Um, but that was, it was a little frightening because he was drawing at that time, he was drawing in this open style with no blacks. And oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. He Because if you look at, um, it was right when he'd come back to DC from Marvel. He had been doing Nova Star and Star, Star Wars. Wars stuff. Yeah. It was right after that. And he'd come up with this style that was all very, very uh, liney, kind of, uh, I'm going to say Alex Nino yeah. know, inspired. It had that weird, you know, just a real graphic quality. It was cool looking. But how do you wrap? How do I wrap my brain around that? Because my sensibilities were so different. But uh, you got to put your yeah. Wally Wood hat on and just go. That's mm -hmm. what, I'm drawing that's a Wally Wood person in the same position. <laughs> I did the double lighting, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I remember that was the first thing. The first one of the first guys um, when I went to DC during that time in New York in in uh, December of '80. I went out. Mike Zek and John Beatty me and this girl that I went with out for dinner and, you know, stuff like that. And one of the times we went up to Marvel, I think it was that Friday and we went out with Joe Rubenstein and Joe's girlfriend at the time. I don't remember the name, but Joe first, first time I meet Joe, right. As a professional to professional, Joe goes, so who are you trying to be? Wally Wood? <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> so I was kind of like amazed that he knew, enough that he could he clearly saw my work you know it's kind of like oh that's kind of neat but it felt very challenging it's like uh well uh i don't how do you answer that <laughs> that's great uh i have a couple more questions and then i want to start wrapping um but there's a couple of things that people ask that we just naturally got to so don't feel left out if i didn't get to you guys uh there was a really good one in here uh, and Mike almost touched on it earlier, Jerry. Right. Alex Neal asks, what's the best advice you were given in your career? You might wow. have to think on that one for a minute. Yeah, because I don't think, I don't remember anybody ever giving me advice. Nobody <laughs> said, come here, kid. Some old guy besides, with a cigar taking you into the office. and Besides <laughs> Joe Rubenstein asking me if I was trying to be Wally Wood. I really, I wish... I, I kind of feel like I would have been better off if somebody might have given me some kind of advice. You know, I think the one thing, you know, you always look back on stuff and you wonder, I mean, I'm happy with all the decisions that I made were decisions that I made. I wouldn't say, Oh, this worked out. This didn't, you still made them and something happened as a result of that. And that's just the way life works. You know, you go left instead of right and it takes you someplace you might not have gone to, but, Maybe you learn something, maybe you could beat up, you know, but it's still something, you're still getting something different out of it. Only those two choices. You either do something right or you're going to get beat up. Or you're going to beat up. Find something new or you're going to get beat up by somebody new. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this is a lightning round, Jerry. All right. So next one is Alex, and then I'm going to get to another person. What was your Image Comics experience like? It was, it was very uh, crazy only because I was used to working with an editor and under a structure. And instead, Al Gordon and I were partners, but it was, there was no middleman to make decisions. So it was a lot of stuff that where you'd, you'd argue, argue over stuff that you could never resolve because nobody ever said, here's, you know, I'm making this, this, is, this decision in the middle here. You know what I mean? Like an editor would say, you know, don't use a unicorn in that story and you want to use a unicorn in the story, the editor is going to not get a story with a unicorn in it. Um, that was, that was what the experience was like was being your own boss and realizing that you had to be in charge of every aspect of the project, including delivering files to the printer, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So it was, I don't think I was prepared for it and I don't think Al Gordon was prepared for it. I mean, I think we did okay. Um, 
But uh, the only other thing, anecdote about that, and this was, will blow people's minds, I think, a little bit. The month that Wildstar came out, Wildstar sold 800,000 copies for a number one. It was like the mm. worst selling image comic that month. <laughs> Which, and again, it was, it was, you know, we were the first guys out of the, out of the main group to really do a book. I mean, the other ones, we were the first guys to get greenlit to do a book. Other books may, may have come out around the same time or maybe, I don't think anybody came out earlier from that. But the same week that that book came out, that Wildstar came out, Marvel put out Secret Avengers, number one, which sold like 900,000 copies. So I always think of that because people still do remember Wildstar. But I think, who remembers Secret Avengers? You know? Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of really generic titles that had foil covers and things that, you know, uh, Valiant put out a ton of them besides Image. Valiant did a ton of them. Marvel did a ton of them. DC jumped on that. They're still bandwagon. doing them. They're still doing all kinds of. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. But, uh, but I mean, it was all, to me, it's always about the content. You know, if you remember the story, that means you read it. And, you know, I don't know. I never read Secret Avengers, so I can't speak for it, but. Um, people would die and go to heaven five times if they sold 800,000 copies. Oh, and yeah. you know, the, the, the ultimate reality is if you sell 800,000 copies and you're, you own it, you get a big paycheck. I mean, the, the paychecks for that, even being like the poor selling image comic, because it didn't break a million. Um, you know, no one said, Oh, you ruined the image or anything. It wasn't like that, but, um, Got to talk Jim off the. Got to talk Jim off the bridge. <laughs> yeah, Rob, Rob Liefeld's coming at me with a hammer at the bench. Um, no, it was, but it was, it was like the money, the money without any company involved, because Image took like ten percent. That was all they they took ten percent, and at that time Malibu was distributing them, so Malibu got a percentage, but it was the reverse of like DC doing death of Superman where DC gets 80% and then the creators or DC gets 90% and the creators share 10%. So with Wildstar, I mean, we each got, it was crazy, like checks for maybe 200 grand for that first issue. And nobody prepares you for that either. You know, I mean, you feel kind of like you're Elvis and you're suddenly, you know, making, you got $200,000 in your checking account or something. <laughs> You know, none <laughs> um, of it went to taxes, you know, more than half, really. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, state. Yeah, that's, that's and they, don't tell you. they don't tell you that when you get a big check like that, basically figure half of it. Yeah. Going to Uncle yeah. Sam. Yeah, no. And, and that was that was the thing. So, like, you don't think of those things because nobody prepares you just like nobody gives you career advice usually, except to say like Gil Kane saying, you know. I never what I never wanted to get any like Gil Kane's critique when I was a fan because I was always afraid, like I wasn't. Uh, I knew my faults and I didn't want to hear somebody else echo them or tell me what they were. <laughs> I was too <laughs> too fragile. <laughs> but uh, mm. yeah, it's funny to think about that. Uh, okay, so uh, a new question just popped up. Uh, Michael Cooper joins us and asks. Jerry, I th well, he's, this is more of a statement than a question. Jerry, I think you were particularly great at storytelling. Can you name one or two other professionals who you felt really nailed storytelling across panels? If I was like, I mean, two of my favorite guys, and I say guys because they were guys, but um, contemporary people, I, I really think um, Lee Weeks is like flat out one of the best. Um, mm -hmm. He just he knows exactly what, what works on a page. Um, I think Ron Garney is another guy who's got a really great innate storytelling sense. Um, it's not, there's a ton of people like that are, it, all you have to do is you have to be thoughtful and think of the story because that's why it's storytelling. It's not pinups or whatever. <laughs> um, I always try to put stuff in and maybe again, I'll take the rap that maybe it's not as bombastic or exciting or whatever. But I want to convey information, and that's always sometimes to the detriment, maybe. Um, but I like conveying information in a in a page. I like the idea that you can follow the art without the balloons and still know what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even know where that came from, but you know, I, I think when I, well, you know, when I was a kid, 
you'd get tidbits of storytelling things in like the back of the treasury editions. Joe Kubert did like a, a how to ink a page or how to draw a page in the back of one of the Tarzan treasury books. And I remember that's pretty much where I got my approach for inking from was that you did your pencil drawing, then you went in with a pen and you inked it and mm -hmm. then you erased it. And then you went in and filled and, and heavied up lines with the, with a brush or filled in areas or whatever. So it was never like a one shot thing where you, you know, mm -hmm. worked it all and then erased the whole completed page. It was always like a process of building up in a way. And that's exact, totally from, from Hubert. Um, but, you know, most of this stuff you look at, you study. We all study. Uh, John B. Summa is a, a terrific storyteller. Kirby was just, most of the guys that you know that you think well of or that are remembered well were good storytellers, you know. Um, I, always, of, I always they think may not have been fancy, you know, but there are yeah. people who are just uh, could take, because that's what you're doing. You're taking someone typing something up who can't draw it and you're making that work on a page in visuals you know it's 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 a it's a, a thought process it's more than even a drawing process you know i mean yeah. i spent most i spent most of my time like i'm doing layouts for my own thing and mm -hmm. i spend a lot of time working out stuff and like i'll take this and probably scan it into the computer and change a whole bunch and then i'll blow it up maybe i'll print it out as a blue line and then I'll change it some more when I'm making it, you mm -hmm. know, um, everybody's process is different, but that's the one thing I liked about the Kubert thing was that, you know, again, not to keep you doing this, like Kubert would do like basic stuff and then he'd fill in the details later. And I think because that got stuck in my brain from reading that, I always feel like if I pencil something too tightly and then I ink it, it feels really boring. Mm. Yeah. It, it Maybe sometimes you can avoid, you know, drawing yourself into a corner where you, you make a mistake or something by kind of free freestyling. <laughs> I think that but it, but it makes guys, it yeah. yeah. And I think that they because Villagran was like that. He would see me pencil something and he'd go, why are you penciling it so tight? Because for him he would just pen like Cupert, he would pencil it tight enough that he could do the rest of the drawing. Right, right. He inked it. So his pencils are about Half as tight. I mean, the eyes are there, and you know, little little details that you want. Right. But he would actually draw a great deal yeah. when he inked it. And well, his work, his work had a tremendous amount of weight. Like his figures had a weight to them that I don't know if he could have penciled for an inker. In other words, you know, it felt like that was kind of somewhat organic. Yeah. Um, and the rendering, because it's almost an eyeball thing, because stuff looks different in pencil than it does in ink, you know? Right, right. When I think in Burn, that, or even Perez, especially Burn, Burn would do like stylistic things, little noodly things, which look great on pencil, on the pencil page. And I can't tell you, when I was inking the Fantastic Four, especially, I would ink the page as, as, as he did it, and then I would go in, erase the pencils, and I would go in and heavy up lines and try to create some... Uh, contrast or whatever and I invariably would wind up filling in a lot of the shaded stuff with black because it didn't have enough punch nowadays you can do that because the colorists seem to be used to working that way they're actually painting shadow and they're painting you know the depth and the all that where you would normally in the old days you put it in with black ink you know you would put yeah. the shadows you create the shadow lines and all that because you didn't now people can draw like that <clears throat> or think of like Jeff Darrow, I guess, with <clears throat> a very delicate line and the color gives it the weight. Which right. Is, that's a obviously a modern, you know, computer era type thing. Um, and Byrne, you know, in that way, I think the only time when he did the Galactus book, was it for Epic or something? It was done in, and Ter Terry Austin inked it and it had that all the decorative little noodly stuff. But the color kind of, brought it together you know um but in a regular newsprint comic you 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 don't have that luxury you know yeah. like mobius I, it wouldn't look this you you need yeah. some blacks in there you know yeah yeah the other uh, the other thing i think with the, the storytelling um is 
you have to decide, like I was just doing a scene where two people are in a kitchen. So you have to decide where to put the camera to see this person's expression in the beginning so that the next panel, you might favor the other person's right. expression, which is the payoff, which is never in the script. They right. will just tell you what's, right. what's happening. And it's right. that thinking that what Toth would do or what you would do or what Gil Kane right. would do or what John Romita right. would do. Now, there's some things that everybody would do because it works better. But then right. some people would be a little bit closer. Somebody be right. a little, Somebody would do something with hands. Right. Right. Somebody would not do something with hands. Right. Somebody would just, if it's two girls, they just want to show the boobs. Right, right. You know what I mean? Like yeah. everybody. <laughs> right, exactly. So um, I was, I always thought, and I've looked at more of his stuff recently. I mean, I always love the stuff, but I think a guy like John Romita was such a fantastic storyteller. Yeah. But it's not obvious yeah. in a way, but we would not love Spider-Man if it was not for him. As much as I love yeah. Ditko, and it Ditko yeah. invented that stuff. And yeah. as great as Stan Lee is, yeah. if he did not have John Romita, nobody right. would be remember Spider-Man the way that we remember him now. Well, the era of Spider-Man that we remember that fondly, we remember it being more... You, you When you look back at the stories, you think there's more Peter Parker interpersonal stuff than there is, but the formula still is like you know, 15 page or 18 pages of action and two pages of, but he, oh, he's he dying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he sold that, he sold that stuff really well. And he, it, again, it's all staging, you know? Yeah. But you, you, we, I think we talked about it years ago. I did it. I think it was one of the early draw magazines. I mean, I always feel like I was as an artist, I'm like a method actor and I feel like I have to somehow, I have to be convinced of what I'm doing. And sometimes all it takes is like a good piece of reference. You know what I mean? It's like something that brings you into it, but I can't do generic and I've never been able to do generic. Um, and I'm like that with writing as well. Like I can't write a generic story that you could sell as a Daredevil story or a mm. Batman story because I always build it from the character out. And when I'm drawing, I always think of it in character form as well. So I do a lot of, like if I have to page with, characters at a you know boring boring page with a whole sequence of people talking in a diner or some confined space you have to keep the camera moving but you also try to give the characters an interesting pose maybe they use their hands more than they would in real life like me doing my hand stuff you know i mean you don't do that as much in real life unless you're arguing with somebody in a you know italian restaurant or something but oh, yeah. um, <laughs> But I mean, it just you, you try to do because you're overacting like in comics, everything's overacting because you got two dimensions. So um, people do that, you know, with the hand coming out of the foreshortening. That's a kind of a, a way of overacting to make something more exciting than it might normally be. People always do this. What? What are you talking about? Right. Everybody goes. You see a lot of this hand action in comics. Where you just got like, yeah, somebody's talking and they're doing. Hey, I do a lot. Yeah, yeah. Everybody does that. That's like, uh, it, it's funny because that's one of the things that I a transition that you do it between doing storytelling in comics and storytelling in animation because in comics this looks normal, but in animation you kept having somebody kept talking and every time they kept talking, hello, oh, yeah, hello, right? It's like. It's like they're like, Rip yeah, exactly. Um, and I did learn uh, to, when you start studying character and movement, you realize that comics need that stronger gesture sometimes. And especially in the quieter scenes, yeah. because you don't have the acting and the right. voice where, in, so, and so comics needs that where in animation, you could have the, the character talking and maybe do some of this and do some of that. And they might make a gesture or something. Right. But you can have a quieter, a quieter thing. You know what I've seen a lot in animation these days is this pose. Like the scratch at the back of the head. <laughs> uh, I don't know. That's because they saw that in Spider-Verse. Is that what that is? That, I saw before that. It's like a lot of scratch at the back of the head. Yeah, if you, if you, you watch the old Hanna-Barbera stuff. <laughs> You, the more realistic stuff, 
you didn't see as much. Gesture, it was gesture. like they, they cut the person like yeah. right here. Right. Well, they yeah. didn't have to draw hands either. Yeah. Right? So someone didn't have right. to animate that hand. <laughs> um, so we're almost, we're almost done here, but I have one, a question and a statement uh, from uh, our good friend, Carla who uh, always checks in is just an awesome person. Carla says, Jerry, what advice do you wish you had gotten when you got into the business? That's a great follow-up question. It is. It is. <laughs> I think, again, it's all hindsight where you always think, did I make this move right? Or did I make, I think back like now I was very loyal to the people I worked with and what I didn't really realize, I guess I thought it could happen. I didn't think it would happen to me, but I thought, that the people I work with would always be there kind of. Hmm. And once they're all new people, right? right. <laughs> once they're all new people, you don't have that same relationship. So basically I think I sacrificed aspects of my career, maybe by being loyal to DC when ultimately I was being loyal to specific people like Mike Carlin and, mm -hmm. you know, people that I liked working with who when they're gone, there's nobody to fill the void. So you you kind of place loyalty in the wrong, in a company entity it, as opposed to a personal thing. So that's, I, I do. That's, that's a weird thing about this business because you know, we've talked about this before. It's you're, 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 and this is something I said the other day about what happened with DC. Everybody gets into this business because we love drawing comics. And then you get into relationships with people that you're working with Right, because you like them and you work well with them, and right. they work well with you, and you like what you like the outcome of it. Right? Right. right, but in reality, everything is controlled by the machine. Right, and in any minute, that machine's going to go plink and kick kick that little cog out. Your that cog's gone, and when right. that cog goes away, your history right goes away. Right, and right. but that's not something you're and you kind of know it a little bit in your back of your mind, like yeah. you say. Yeah. But it's like, and it happened with the guys that we grew up admiring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It but you, with everybody ultimately. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, you can kind of see like, wow. Yeah. If you if you put all your eggs in the basket, as they say, you know, eventually. And I think that that's the one of the hardest things about comic book, the comic book business, because how many times, even though if you were on contract or not, it's like. Like Carlin calls you up on the phone, or this person calls you up on the phone. Hey, you want to do this? Yeah, sure. That sounds like fun. And then you go off and you have fun. But five minutes later, the torpedo can come in. Right, right. Something happened. The company right. gets sold. These people right. get kicked out. And all of a sudden, right. yeah, yeah, the guy, the new guy doesn't know anything about what the other guy said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, ultimately, that, and then, and to, to actually specifically answer the question, I wished that someone had told me to diversify more as far as the the companies i always when i was first in comics i worked for everybody i didn't really feel beholden you know i, I worked for Mar for dc because i felt like they gave me the first shot and then i went to marvel and you know to do the fantastic four and then dc convinced me to come back and then i was at dc pretty much and i wished that i'd taken up I was never that fast, so I could do one book. I could never do two books, like one for each company or something. But I'd wish that I'd develop more of a relationship with the Marvel people. But by the same token, I didn't enjoy hanging out at Marvel back in the 80s because they were like, it was kind of like the jocks. You know, there was a certain attitude about like where Marvel and DC sucks. And, you know, I mean, they were pretty nasty towards DC. It was very competitive, whereas DC seemed like pretty nice you know it felt more like it was in my wheelhouse there they generally were nice nicer they didn't say bad things about marvel you know i mean it was just a weird mm -hmm. uh choice but i wish I'd, i i think i wish i'd i kept my eye on my career a little more than on my friendships and that sounds weird but because i think i could have had i still could have had i would have had those friendships like if i didn't work for carlin he still would have been my friend Right. Like maybe I would have made friends with some other people that would have helped me 10 years later at DC when Carlin was not there, you know, and there was no advocate for me, you know. So that's the stuff you think about in, in retrospect. So if, I would say to anybody, like when I see people at shows and they're asking about stuff, 
I say, well, number one, I don't think the same model existed that existed when any of us started where you would try to get work for Marvel at DC because it was a regular paycheck. You know, if you want to do comics now, it feels like it's right to do your own IP, your own characters, your own stuff. And then maybe you get the attention of Marvel at DC and you can use them to. It's like reversed. Big, it's almost do, reversed. Yeah, bigger profile or something. But once you get into the Marvel DC thing, it's hard to break from it because then you're married and you have kids and you're really, you know, I mean, you're dependent on mm -hmm. a, a living that's stable, you know. You're yeah. drawing 22 pages a month or whatever it is, you know you're you're going to make this money. Should have been a hippie. You just should have been a hippie. Here. <laughs> <laughs> it you is funny have, though. I mean, yeah. uh, yeah. Jerry, I have some uh, PTSD to talk to you about. <laughs> uh -oh. So our good buddy Tim Fielder, this is a statement, less a question. <laughs> Hi, Jerry. Your ancient pamphlet comic, Proton, traumatized the hell out of me as a young boy in the Mississippi Delta of the 1970s. It was a little bit more. I remember specifically this large building-sized worm creature that was dissolving people as they floated into its huh. mouth. Wow. You have any, you have, <laughs> so you put it out of your memory. Well. For that honestly, it, it still carry like it, it is. It may be one of those uh, nightmare type things that your 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 brain builds upon. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Proton was an alien guy, and he he basically took over some dying guy's body. But I don't remember. I remember him frying people, you know, with his <laughs> powers. That's so seventies. <laughs> although that's that sounds like one of those uh, traumatizing movies of my childhood. There was, uh, <laughs> you know, was it the like the Blob or something? <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> 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 That's great. So what are you well, working, what are you working on now, Jerry? What are you you said I'm you were... doing I'm doing commissions. I just I did um I have stuff in the first two issues of Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology that Craig Russell is is adapting. And I get the I get to draw the the story of Loki and the gifts of the gods, which was one of my favorite in that in that book that, that Neil had written. I was already familiar with the book, so it was kind of like a no-brainer. I really uh, enjoyed doing it. But uh, that got delayed. That was supposed to be out in June. Now I think it comes out in October. Um, and I, I finished up my Submariner thing. I, I worked right right up to the – you know how it is when you're on a deadline. I was on the Submariner thing that came out in March, and then I immediately jumped into the Neil Gaiman Norse mythology. So I worked right up to about March – eighth and then i finished my deadlines and then the world shut down <laughs> you know and i was like oh i should have seen a couple of more movies before this happened but <laughs> um so i haven't i and again i've not done anything except a couple commissions it's just it's it's been kind of it was initially very depressing i'm sure if you didn't have pressing deadlines or whatever you probably went through it too or even if you did um I just did some commissions. I've been trying to do some Proton. I want to do another uh, another Proton comic for when conventions start up at some point. Um, Would you ever do something like that as a Kickstarter so you could... could uh, I'm, do I don't know what it is about me, but I feel like I have to get it done. You know, and then maybe Kickstarter would work as a to collect it or something. I just don't... I feel kind of like I'm... I'm I'm selling something that's not done, I guess is my feeling. Hmm. And there's a, I don't know how you are. You're doing a lot of work and everything with the strips and stuff, but I've lost a certain amount of, of uh, initiative. You know, the older I've gotten, I feel, especially the last couple of years, I kind of feel like, well, I don't know if I want to work that hard anymore. I mean, I, I still need to make money, but I think about these deadlines. Like I did two, Marvel books last year. I did Captain America one set in, you know, World War II era, and then the Submariner one set post war. And that was fine. I mean, I would, I'm happy with that level of involvement in the, the mainstream comic industry, but I don't get a lot of calls for that either. You know, I mean, I really enjoyed working on the Marvel stuff. I'm hoping maybe I can convince them to do a Submariner or a Human Torch so I can get all three of the original uh, Marvel um, characters together. But uh, 
the stuff I would like to work on is not stuff that anybody offers me. Like I, I could immediately jump into a Superman story because it's in my wheelhouse and I would feel really, it was always fun to draw that character. I could do JSA, you know, no one would have to argue or convince me, but I don't get asked, asked to do that stuff. Um, but that's the stuff that I would like to do. That's the stuff that's more fun to do as far as company type stuff. Um, <clears throat> I like the Marvel stuff. I like, I like doing Captain America. I like the era again, doing the stuff set in a specific period. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's weird. Like some people have the ability to, I, I'm never, I don't call up somebody and say, Hey, you, you should put me on this book or that book. I kind of feel like after 40 years, they know what I can do that they should just call me if they're interested. You know what I mean? There's a period of time. Yeah. That they, yeah. Yeah. Years ago, yeah, that I was selling myself really hard to editors and not getting callbacks and stuff. And I started feeling really sh crappy about it. You know, I, I kind of like put it on me. It was like, wow, this sucks. Um, <clears throat> and then I just basically realized that I was trying to, I was trying to be part of a club that didn't necessarily want me. Like I was, um, I felt like I was clearly, my turning moment was when DC did the new 52 and I was thinking like, okay, I knew I wasn't in their top 10 artists, but I'm not even in their top 52 artists. You know what I mean? I did, I didn't get a call on any of those books and that kind of hurt. And then I mm -hmm. just questioned, you know, you spend time thinking about it. It's like, why am I letting it hurt me? Well, you know, I'm human. And I feel like I invested a lot of years with DC and, and, uh, so that kind of stings, but then you have to get past it and go, you know, I'm making my own way and I can live without that. But a nostalgic part of me still likes those characters. You know, that's the appeal, I think, for anybody. You oh, grow yeah. up reading Batman and then you have an affinity for Batman. Oh, it'd be cool to be Batman or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, um, they, they relaunched Darkhawk three times. They've never oh, called really? to do a cover. Yeah. No, I mean even a variant. And, and, they, and it's clearly, they're, yeah, they're, and clearly they're they're not. And people ask me, and it's called, clearly because they don't want to, right? right. I mean, there's the reason why, uh, who knows what the reason why? But the main reason why is that they don't want to. You know? There's nobody there who's who you're on. You're not on their mind. You're not, you know. And that's again, it's fair because it's all like it's like for example, DC, all a lot of young people, and I I can work with anybody. I'm not like a I'm a good good work experience for anybody who's worked with me. I always add value to whatever story I do, <clears throat> but I'm not I'm not calling people all the time. I feel like you know you do that when you're young and you you know I mean I really did feel at a certain point to send like emails to people who knew me to not get responses felt kind of personal, and and then I just question why why am I letting this bring me down. But it's well, because you set yourself up for it. It's almost like dating somebody and then not having them call you back or something. You know, it's kind of on you for the having the expectations that maybe are unrealistic or whatever. Well, I also think that there's a lot. And I don't of mean to be a sad sack. And I'm not trying to portray that because I'm kind of okay with it. But I do have a twinge whenever I read about something. I go, oh, they're reviving the JSA. Well, that'd be kind of fun to do. Or, you know, DC 80th anniversary of. Superman, I got to do a story in there, but nobody offered me one of the 8,000 variant covers, you know? <laughs> it's like, right. is an era of Superman, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. same, same thing with the uh, Batman stuff, which is one of the reasons why I quit the book, and one of the reasons why I left DC to go into animation, because I could yeah. sort of see the writing was on the wall yeah. in, the in the 90s, the writing yeah, no. on the well, wall. You, your, your whole team, you were the first guys to get kind of let go as a group, right? Yeah, well, I... I, I, I but quit. you left before? Yeah, I left before, yeah, because I could kind of see the way that it was going, and it was yeah. not it was not what I thought that it would be yeah. when I was in... when I got the book, because I was initially pumped, but I then I could see that the way the corporate structure was already starting to happen, where everybody yeah. has these big meetings, and then you're just like the guy that gets to draw this... 10 pages out of this multiple part story. Right. It's really hard to make a foot. Your, your luck comes in. My luck was yeah. that was the guy in the book 
when they did that stuff that sold the most for that <laughs> little bit of time, which right. will always stay in print, which right. pays me a nice royalty every right. couple of every couple of months. But creatively, you're not involved in being creative. You're involved in killing the deadline. Right. And right. That's you can't be Frank Miller or Neil Adams or somebody else just doing right. that stuff because you do not have right any creative charge other than right. trying to draw the strip in the best way. Fans right. have no idea, and nor do you when you're starting out in comics, have any idea that this is how the corporate structure will probably end up. And it's even more that way now than it was 20 years ago. Yeah. Because now you have these editorial groups Right. That and it's not like it was at Marvel and the or DC even in the early nineties where to say, Hey, do you want to do this thing? Yeah, that sounds like fun. Right. Then you go do it. And if it yeah. works, great. If it doesn't, you go right. do something else. Right. But it's now it's like it's all controlled from editorial, partially I think because they don't want the artist to ever have the control that yeah. we had. Yeah. up into that point. And so well, they, they, think they can how, subtly keep you, I mean, they can keep your profile however they want it. Right. And, and they've been a writer centric kind of business, even Marvel for the, since 2000, it's been pretty much writer centric. So a writer can write two issues a month of a book, but an artist, the same art team can't draw those two issues a month. Therefore the writer can have a memorable run on a book with well who was the artist on it it was multiple mm -hmm. guys so like mm -hmm. when i was doing all-star squadron i got associated with that for good or bad i mostly good i got associated for being the artist who did these characters you don't really an artist doesn't have that ability if they're on a book that's shipping twice a month you know um right. or if you're if you're being cycled out every four issues on storylines and then somebody else comes in the artist never gets a foothold to make a name for himself on a character. Um, that's a big, that's the biggest difference because, you know, I, I do a lot of sketches, <clears throat> commissions and sketches for people of Superman, Shazam, whatever. They're characters I'm associated with. And that's kind of almost like some kind of job security for your retirement age, you know, <laughs> that someone's going to want a Superman drawing or whatever. Um, but if you never get that opportunity to make a mark on an individual character as an artist, that's a big, that's a marketing tool in a way for the artist, you know, that, that the artist doesn't have. It's like you can do 50 different titles, but you're not really known for one specific thing. Mm -hmm. You're not at the same, you know, level, I think, you know. Yeah. I mean, Frank yeah. Miller doing Daredevil, that, that association still exists. Walt Simonson doing Thor or whatever. I mean, I wrote Superman for a long time. And the biggest difference for me was post 98 when Eddie Braganza fired all the Superman guys was that uh, um, I never regained my writing stature in comics. I never had a regular book after that either, even though I tried. I never landed a monthly title. And that's kind of what I always felt like I was built for. You know, I'm built for having that commitment every month and knowing, you know, when you get up on Monday morning, you got to do pages. There's something that, you know, is I did that for so many years. It just becomes like a ingrained, you know. Yeah. Well, I think also to us, uh, the guys coming up in our era, that that when we got in the business, that was your dream is that you would be able to get your monthly comic, whatever that was, and you would be like, the guys we admired that's what they did they sat down every day every day and they drew and they turned out one or two or three depending upon right. your basema the basema brothers or gil kane but they drew monthly comic books yeah. and they well, yeah. they drew a lot of them and they and and yeah. and, and once that, you're not once you're not on the on the you're in the comic store every month you really do get forgotten quickly because there is a turnover of readership and even if there's not a turnover People just disappear. You know what I mean? You could, uh, from the time I stopped doing Shazam, you know, you, I, I've done some good miniseries projects. I got to work with a bunch of good writers over that period. I got to work with Alan Moore. I did a bunch of stuff with Jeff Johns. That was really fun. 
but you don't have the same, uh, I guess it's like, you're not, you don't have the same visibility that you do when you're on a monthly, because also when you're on a monthly, the company tends to ignore you less, obviously. And those are the guys, I mean, it always was like that probably for you too, but when you're busy, you, I was always doing stuff. Like I was doing a monthly book and someone would, other editor would call to ask me to do a cover or something. So you always did extra work. They always threw the work at the guy who was already busy. You know what right. I mean? So it's right. not being in that, it just in that system like that, they just, people forget about you, you know? So no, no, no. Your, your daughter's trying to do comics too. And are you, uh, paying attention to like, you know, the, the young graphic novels and uh, oh yeah webtoons and things like yeah, that. Yeah. I don't do that. I don't do the webtoons. I but I I mean I keep I keep current on what's at the comic store and I I keep current via Twitter with a lot of people. It's a lot of people who I think are pretty good. I've never read a comic of theirs, but I see the art they post or I see stuff. Um, I mean I think you know there's a lot of people who think comics. You, you I hate this put a tag on somebody, but there's, there's like a certain type of fan that thinks everything should have frozen at whatever specific time they were 10 years oh, old, 12 years yeah. old, whatever, yeah. <laughs> nothing should change. But then at the same time, they don't want anything else to change around them, you know? So they don't like comics. They maybe don't even read comics or they complain about them, but they're not really buying them. You know what I mean? Right. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I still go every Wednesday I look at what comes, I buy, I still buy a lot of stuff. I've been reading more lately than I did in having a long time. I just got tired of piling them up. <laughs> I started reading them. Oh, so you mean you just bought them and didn't read them or you just looked at well, them? Yeah, and I would buy them with the intention of reading them. And then I would, I would get like, oh, I'll sort them and I'll read six at a time, like six issue storyline or something. And, uh, and that got kind of frustrating. So once DC cut me off, I stopped getting the comps years ago. Um, I didn't have that pressure to keep up with the DC books either, but I, st I still, I read a bunch of Marvels. I read a few DCs, but I like, um, I like a lot of Marvel stuff and, uh, I still buy independence and things like that. Um, to me, it's like something that you, it, it's just like, once you figure like for drawing, like, you know what you're doing, then you're kind of cooked. Like you always should be reaching and you should always be trying and not be confident in what you're doing. There's a certain level of confidence that gets you through the day, but generally you should always question your work because the minute your brain thinks you're perfect is when you suck. I mean, you yeah. have to keep, yeah. so, and I feel that way about the industry as a whole that you have to, if you, I, I still want to be part of it. And I know I'm not a main part of it, but I still like comics, not as much as, as when I was a kid, as far as reading, but I still like them as a, as an art form, and I still want to stay current to a degree because there's excitement in what young people are doing, you know? Um, I mean, maybe it's the fact that I have my own kids and they're growing up, you know, now, whatever, but you see the world through their eyes and you understand that the world is changing and the world is different for every generation. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean it's worse. It doesn't mean it's better or that you're, you know, you're... You know, your 1980 was better than my 1980 or whatever. Um, my 1880 was better than your 1980. <laughs> well, <laughs> do uh, well, you know. Uh, I like those co those coal file coal fired pens. <laughs> they always you know, worked, I, and then they kept you heated up in the winter when you were <laughs> in the unheated rooms. I, I've been I've been um been excited to see what the uh, webtoons is giving their. Uh, winner of their contest tonight for their new they had their new like sh sh uh, comic contest oh cool they had thousands of people entering this con there's thousands of young cartoonists out there all yeah. over the world that are entering and producing stuff so I think that's the thing that always makes me even if I have my days where I you know you, you get a little down or whatever Car cartooning is still is probably more there are more cartoonists alive and working today than there have ever been 
yeah. up, up until this year of all the previous generations combined. Which I well, think there also, there was a lot of different voices. You yeah. Know, um, it less of less of the mainstream feel, you know, um, people just telling personal stories and things like that, which is kind of mm -hmm. cool. Would you I ever do anything like, like that? Would you do like the the Tales of the Old Man in the Bar by Jerry <laughs> Orkway? <laughs> I did a I did a three page story for Aftershock in um, I drew it in May, and it's called SOS. It's Save Our Stores. They did it. They sent it to comic stores as a like a freebie that the store can sell if they want, you know, and, and they get the profits. But I did a three page story that was autobiographical and I, I, I felt really constricted to three pages, you know, like, even though I knew, I told the guy I couldn't do a lot. And I said, I'd be happy to do a five page story. And he said, well, I have three pages. So I just adapted and did, you know, my little story, but it was about first comic stores that I was part of. And, uh, it was fun to do, and it maybe it did make me think about you know putting some autobiographical stuff down. I think the problem is I have too many ideas, and it's like having too many color choices. It sometimes it paralyzes you. So I have like story ideas on my computer that I was I was thinking the only way to do this I think is to find someone to draw them because I just don't I don't have the time, you yeah. know. So. Yeah. Um, I, d I definitely think that's the way to go to find some, you know, some young artist who's uh, hungry enough to work cheap. <laughs> but there's plenty of them out there. <laughs> no, that's so, that's super there's, always, there's always the uh, Jerry Ordway, the 1980 Jerry Ordway of, two, of 220, right? <laughs> I thought you were going to say the Jerry Ordway School of Cartooning. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yes. Have a pipe. That's right. The Jerry Ordway Karate Dojo, right? Yeah. Yeah. Draw, what, what? Draw Skippy. <laughs> right. So, so you, you, you never had a. I remember uh, Giordano told me the first time that I met him that if I could always draw heads and hands well, I would always be able to find work. That's yeah. the advice that he, he gave. No, I remember him saying that too. Yeah. Yeah. I used to think, I mean, I always thought of it when I was the young guy, I never had a problem working with the older dudes because I always thought of it as history, you know, and uh, I was I was intimidated, like with Gil Kane or whatever. But it was really cool at the same time because you knew that these were people who'd been around for a long time and saw a lot of stuff and did a lot of stuff. Um, but I always felt like the guy I got close to was Kurt Swan because he used to do he used to go to the Connecticut cartoonist meetings. And I got to know him in a you know social setting, and he was just a sweet guy. But he was he was, uh, you know, he was like an underrated in a way underrated artist because he wasn't bombastic like uh, the Kirby stuff or whatever. Um, but he always had a good attitude about stuff, and I always used to look at him and think, okay, Kurt, you know, he's in uh, he's in his seventies and people still want to work with him, and I always felt like if I was still capable of holding a pencil, and drawing halfway decent had the desire that somebody would naturally, you know, be like, Oh yeah, call up Jerry and have him do this. So call I mean, up I Jerry or but instead you find yourself kind of thinking, you know, am I Dick Sprang? You know what I mean? Where where you're you're kind of on the margin for so long and Dick Sprang retired, but like remember they brought him back for like a Batman anniversary thing and it was really cool, but at the same time you think, at what point do you feel like your work is so different from what everybody else is doing that you're you are super dated you know um so that's that that i always think of that i think well i think i could still compete with what i see coming from marvel and dc i think i would fit in there but there are moments where you start going okay is it like the dick sprang effect you know are you are you just not seeing it and you're you know you know what i mean you're like People are going, wow, look at that guy wearing the flare pants or the <laughs> belt buttons, you know? <laughs> and you're like, those are so out of style. Wow. Wow. Jerry, I'm gonna I'm gonna shut you off after that one. <laughs> All right, last question of the night, and then we gotta go home. Uh Dave Desmond says, Jerry, what's on your pull list? What are you reading right now? I am reading the Indestructible Hulk, which is a great book. Um from Marvel. This uh Al Ewing has like 
really just reinvented the Hulk with all the pieces that already existed. It's really clever. I mean, he's what he's doing with the Hulk is kind of what Jeff Johns did with Green Lantern. He found he took everything that was existing and he made something new. Um, it's a great superhero book. It's like a, almost like a horror book, but it's mm. a really good, uh, good book. Um, I like the Captain America. That's um, I think again they've had rotating artists, and I, I'm going to mispronounce his name. Is it Taneshi Coates? I don't know how it's pronounced. Tallahassee, the, the writer. The, yeah, yeah. It, he's, yeah. He's he's done some in, really interesting stuff on Captain America. I don't know. If, I don't hear anybody talking about it, but it's a really good, solid read. Um, I buy. Uh, I'm trying to think of the. I just picked up a big stack of stuff. I've been liking specific stuff like from DC, but I buy, um, I've been buying um, certain image stuff. It sort of put me on the, on the, on the spot thinking about the, uh, what was the best, I'm trying to think of like it was the most fun thing I read. I just I really bought Oh, I I don't think I saw that one. Is that the one that's based on the sixties kind of style? Or? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's, it's like, what if like, Dick Sprang, but uh, that was print, wasn't that didn't DC print like comic versions of that in the like maybe ten years ago? Did they? I I, I don't know. I, I saw somebody posted about this on um, somebody posted about it on uh, Facebook. So I uh, I ordered <laughs> it, and it, it's it's, cool. it, it's it's fun stuff. That is looks interesting. I've been picking. I, I don't know if you guys like classic comics. But oh yeah. Um, I always liked the uh, Salinas stuff in the Cisco Kid because you could see, you could see where like John Severin, oh yeah, and John Buscema were inspired by that stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. pretty illustrated. Right. Yeah, but I mean, I like old stuff. I do. I was. I've been reading the like Marvel's been doing the uh, their new uh, crossover with the, the Skrulls and the Kree, and I, I've been enjoying that. You know, it's. I don't read a lot of crossover stuff, but I know enough like a basic Marvel history from the past that I don't I don't need the last twenty years to to, to you know feel lost or whatever. Right, you get it. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you, do you read any manga or any uh, European yeah, stuff? I'm not. I I don't really. I not much. No, I think I used to. I mean, I like stuff that I have read, but I don't think I've picked up anything in a while. A lot of it mm. is based on. You go through previews every month because the comic store is not going to be guaranteed to order any everything. So I, I try to pre-order whatever I feel like I don't want to miss. And sometimes you also go, okay, I think I've already ordered $200 worth of books. And I don't want to have that, you know, hit the comic store every week. And sorry, start. sorry, kids. We're just beans for the next four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> We have a lot of dried peas. We'll be having. <laughs> well, at least we're not seeing Jerry getting a, a the shame stack on Instagram. Jerry Ordway, please pick up these comics. You owe us seven thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, I always I always pick up my stuff. I, I, I feel like that's a that's like a, one of the worst things you can do to a comic store. Um, it happens, and and these guys are like already working on the margins, you know, with some of this. So you see somebody with a pull file that hasn't been picked up, you feel bad for them because they can't really put it on this on the racks and have anybody interested in it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like back issues, they don't have the same allure, I guess, unless uh, it's some hot event book or something. Right. Do you use, uh, uh, do you use a, what comic comicsology? Do you do any of that where you get it digitally as opposed, to, or you really want to have the physical print? Yeah, I don't. I don't really. I mean, I like the tactile experience i mean i really don't i have a comiXology account and in a pinch if i need reference for something that i either don't want to look for two hours to find <laughs> i will just buy it and 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 that'll be the end of it but i don't really it's not a i don't even like reading like the two morrows i get the digital versions i prefer to read the magazines the magazines um man. it's just you know i think if i was five years younger i might be more inclined but I think I have too many years of, it, of of material here, you know, that I still like looking at, you know, it's hard to, it was hard to adjust it. I think, I really think that cutoff would be 
five years younger, you might be more agreeable to, to picking up digital stuff. But uh, uh, yeah, I do. I, I find that I do like the different um, the different formats. Like I do like webtoons. I actually I'm very. I think I even got in more to like maybe was into it, but the students in my class were really into it, and I saw how naturally. Yeah. And so instead of trying to be resistant to it, is to find out if there's a different way of experiencing it. And in a way, it's sort of like when you were a kid and you saw Speed Racer, like kids in the 60s, or Kimba or right. uh, Astro Boy, they were very different than yeah. the, the other yeah. stuff. And there was something about the, I don't know, like poetry of how those stories were told. Right. It really affected me in a way that was different than Johnny Quest. Even though I loved Johnny Quest and I loved all that stuff, there was something I remember, especially about, especially Kimba, because they always do these things where he was like looking up at the sun and they would do all these like photographic lens effects or right, whatever. Right, right. So I'd sort of like, I could show them, I would show them, I could even probably show them that Batman manga. And they would kind of relate relate to that actually more as a Western comic than an, than manga or anime. Interesting. You know? And just seeing how they absorb telling a story in a different way yeah. than what we got in the 22 page. And one of the girls told me, one of the students said that she didn't, she would feel uh, unsatisfied just getting 20 pages of, yeah. It's like I don't want to have to keep, you know. Then you got to wait right. another. But, yet, but if you compare it to like the the manga stuff, I mean, because my kids all bought, especially during the, I guess early two thousands, there was a lot of, I mean, we have tons of books here, and I would look at stuff, you know, um, I thought Death Note was really well yeah. done. It was nicely drawn as well, um, but there's there's a point where you when you look at those at the manga stuff, you realize that everybody's format is paced to the specific you know physical quality of the book like a 22 page comic or a 20 page comic has about the same story content as maybe one or two volumes of manga the pacing is generally very much slower yeah uh, maybe three panels on a page you know what i mean it's 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 not a i'm not saying one's better than the other it's just that the format itself that dictates the pacing of the book. So if you if 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 you compared American comics to Japanese comics or you know uh, um, Korean or or whatever, you're gonna it's they're used to their format and they're used to their pacing. You know, like One Punch Man is pretty crazy. I I'm familiar with that. The cartoon's great. I my daughter and I watched that. That was fun. Um, but the the you know, the books themselves, they're like American comics, but they're like image comics in that there's really not that much in a volume. You know what I mean? It's like a lot of big splashes and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not, it's not like an apples and oranges comparison. I think it, it, if you're used to that type of reading experience, then, you know, then maybe you, you adjust to American comics in a different way if you wind up. Because a lot of the manga stuff brought a lot of, I think American kids to comics when Viz and the different companies kind of imploded yeah. you know, early on those, they were buying a lot of that and they had no place to go. And therefore now you have, I think a lot more books that are targeted to girls and targeted um, differently than just the, you know, kids who liked superhero punch fests or whatever. Um, and that's a good thing, you know, because I think that's what keeps stuff alive is, is uh, you know, you're, you're, you're satisfying an audience that didn't only had maybe Archie comics as an alternative. So then they get Batgirl, maybe DC gets smart and then they do Gotham girls or whatever. You know I mean? They're, they're doing stuff that I think sells really well to that audience and the fanboys don't like it because maybe they're threatened by it or something. I don't know. But uh, but it's good because that helps your. I mean, it's you know, silly. It's silly. Real comics punch. I know. 
You know, <laughs> they they settle everything with a fist, not talking. <laughs> Nobody talks. <laughs> well, they have two pages of talking, then some fighting. <laughs> You know, but that that's flip too. And again, I mean, you know, we're probably going on too long here. But so, what what would be if you were to recommend to somebody young, uh, younger, uh, not super familiar with your stuff? What would be like the three things that you would say that they should? That are the three quintessential Jerry Ordway. Well, I would say Power Shazam. Right. I think that's. Um, I mean, I wrote that when my kids were little and I kind of wrote it with them in mind in a way, especially my daughter, because, you know, that era was the era of stripper female characters rather than, you know what I mean? They were all hypersexualized and there really wasn't much kid friendly even approach for them, you know, like so that Mary Marvel was pretty much kind of targeted towards my daughter not having that you know those type of characters um i it's it's a toss-up because i a lot of the superman stuff that i really liked they never really reprinted a lot of the stuff when i was writing and drawing it except for death of superman they restarted the man of steel collection is coming out next week or no shazam comes out next week end of the month is the first volume and they're not like like this they're not omnibuses but they have like basically 13 the equivalent of 13, 14 issues in a book. And the Man of Steel is the same price point. I think it's, yeah, it's 50 bucks, 49.99. And um, they're reprinting stuff that DC reprinted in the Man of Steel trade paperbacks before they abandoned those. So at each step, they had finally gotten to where I started writing stuff. <laughs> um, but we, like, if you get the Superman in Exile omnibus, that is a lot of me i mean it's a lot of my um input into superman and superman stories uh do you have different ones that are different like things that are favored artistically or some that are more favored as writing yeah i mean I, it's it's weird though because like like a Sh shazam is really the one series that i felt like and I know I wasn't drawing it. You guys were, you and Pete were doing the art, but I felt like with, with Superman, there was always the, we're working with five guys or four other, three other writers or four other writers. And you can't really call it your own. Even when your ideas are there, it's someone else's filtering or, or it's like you throw the idea out there and that, you know, Roger Stern gets to write that story or something. It's not being petty, but it's just that you don't get a sense of like this Shazam is my thing. You know, I wasn't having to work with 15 other people, you know, so what you get is me. Um, I felt like that other stuff I've done that I've drawn, that I've worked with other people, I think the Tom Strong stuff was really fun. And I don't know if that's available. I think DC might have let that go out of print. Um, but the Tom Strong, I did a, a bunch of different issues for that. I did stuff with Jeff Johns on JSA. Um we did the the one that probably is more available than anything is the uh, the Black Adam um, arc story arc with the JSA. Um, but yeah, it's I mean I've done I've done favorite things that I've done. I really like doing Red Menace and the, the writer guys that worked on the Flash TV show. They were great to work with, and uh, that was a fun kind of all in one five issue thing. I really like doing. I did a thing for Wildstorm uh, with Warren Ellis. It was a planetary JLA uh, crossover, kind of crossover. That was really fun because it was again some like a different experience. Um, yeah, it's just I mean, there's you jump around. I, you know, early in the career, I worked with Roy Thomas. I did Infinity Inc. and stuff. But those, I felt like I was the guy trying to put my ideas into somebody else's stories. Um, so it's it's different when you start you know, controlling it yourself. I think your more your personality comes out. Mm -hmm. um, now, can people order from you your Proton stuff that's out? Yeah, I have a link on, it's actually still up on my uh, blog spot, which I haven't updated in a million years. Uh, Google blog. It was Ortster's, Ortster's Random Thoughts. 
The problem is I had two of them. I had Proton and I had the Messenger and the Messenger is sold out and I'm down to like one copy of my own and I don't want to reprint it. You know what I mean? Just because mm-hmm. it's like I want to push myself forward and do another uh, another uh, self-published thing. So I'm kind of like, I'm just surprised that that one sold out. You know, it's been for sale longer, but I think, you know, when people order it on Twitter, I had it posted on my, as a tag tweet on my Twitter profile and people would order it and they generally would order both issues rather than ordering one or the other. So I had to pull that down and have to, I have to fix the link, but, uh, but this is what Proton, the, this one I had, do have copies of. And, you know, when I was, if I was a kid, I would have been mind blown at how, easy it is to get a professional looking black and white comic done you know and not really Mm -hmm. that expensive if i could if i sold more it would be cheaper but um it's actually really nice for the oh yeah you know when you think about like the the print quality it's 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 really good are you using kablan uh for the type no for for the the, for the printing no it's a printing service comics wellspring okay use them um, the mm. only downside to them is that it's you have to pay for shipping, and shipping, of course, has gotten more expensive. So, yeah, uh, but the quality is good, and they 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 have. Uh, I just have done the two things with them. They're they're pretty solid. But I think if you could yeah. sell more, like if I could sell a thousand of them. Okay, everybody listening, everybody money. tonight. <laughs> no, no, one dollar. <laughs> to Jerry Ordway, <laughs> Washington. But do you, Mike, when you're at shows, or even you, you know, Jamar, when you got at a show, you have your books and you have your price on them and stuff. Yeah, I have people who I've charged five bucks for this because mm-hmm. I wanted to make it com- comparable to a comic because it's a basically a 32 page. It's got you know commissions and half of its comic, and I have mm-hmm. people kick the tires like they come by and they look at it and I'm like. It's like five bucks. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, well, if you made if you made it ten, they'd buy it. I think there's a it's just some psychology. <laughs> I'm work, saving I, my money for the Burt Ward autograph. Yeah, I know. I just thought it was funny. I have one person, and this is a, the way our brains are working. You know, you comic collecting is one step shy of hoarding, right? I mean, we all <laughs> know it. You know, we're like we're not saving our pizza boxes yet. <laughs> Says you. There's that. Sil- okay. <laughs> There's that. That's how I send out my commissions. <laughs> Would you like extra cheese with that? <laughs> <laughs> but I just think it's funny. I had so I had a person come to my table and have these all in zip in in like comic bags, just because mm. it's easier to transport. It's easier to put them out. So I had them all in comic bags, and this person came by and opened every single one of them, and looked at them. And Every then, single one in the bag? I had 15 copies sitting on the table. They opened each one and they looked at it very carefully and then they wound up buying one. I mean, they put them back in the bag very nicely, but it was just, <laughs> it was an example of what, you know, it's, it's, we're all different in a little different ways. Some of us save everything. I mean, I save tons of paper. I have all my artwork, most of my artwork. I got tons of books. Some stuff I get rid of just to make room for new stuff, mm-hmm. you know. But it's not like you're solving your problem. <laughs> you're just no. <clears throat> freeing up like one foot so that you could put a foot full of books in, you know, in that shelf. But mm-hmm. we're all like we're all on that kind of like collectors have that kind of mentality. So I understood it, but I also thought it was kind of interesting because I'd never, I'd never seen that before, <clears throat> that somebody would go through each one of these things. And again, you didn't, you didn't squirt them with the water bottle or anything like that. I didn't want to ruin the books. Down. The books were out of the bag. I didn't want to ruin the <laughs> book. <laughs> you should have waited until he did it with the third one. And then when he started the fourth one, <laughs> get it with That's the squirt right. bottle. That's and then right. I also, Bad I fan. Know, I, had a, I had a guy try to buy, a, wanted to buy one of the protons. I think it was at Baltimore. And he asked me if I took PayPal. And I said, I really don't. But that, you know, if I could track my daughter down, she could do it for me. And then he goes, he hands me a hundred dollar bill. And I'm like, what? I really can't give you change for a hundred bucks. I, it was like the first day. Yeah. <laughs> what? So I was amused by that. 
The two, the, the only two things he has, uh, PayPal or a hundred dollar bill. <laughs> he didn't buy a damn thing that weekend because nobody took <laughs> PayPal. Five dollar electronic purchase for a hundred dollar bill. All right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, Jerry, we're we're gonna let you go pee, but this has been really great. Uh, thanks for joining <laughs> us tonight. And I hope you, I hope you'll come back again. Uh, the all of our fans and view, viewers had a great time listening to your stories and learning Did a little bit sound, more about okay? you. Yeah, no, you sound, you sound great. Yeah, you sound great. Right, or you said you were doing it on yeah, your iPad? Yeah, I, I put, I, I bought an adapter to put on my old tripod just to get the iPad at, at the right level, eye level. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the the speaker is on the side, but it seems like it's okay. Yeah. I just yeah have you ever done, have you done, because how many people have you had on at the most on your? Um, Six, I think. Yeah. On screen. The, the audio or the video breaks up when you get more than a, a couple people. No, no, this, this new technology we're using is pretty, pretty robust. Like, I think this uh, stream service we use can have up to 10 people on the screen. Well, I don't think I did, we need, we don't need to do that, though. John Suntress <laughs> does the Word Balloon podcast, mm -hmm. and he's been doing, um, Streamyard, is that what this is? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And he, um, because he could put up a bunch of people, I was it was like crazy. It was like the Brady Bunch. You know, there was like nine yeah. people, and yeah, when I... he got to five, it was fine. When he got to six, people's voices started breaking up. When he so got to seven, wavy. eight, nine, I, my the picture didn't freeze, but I could not hear anybody. It was all dip, 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 dip. So yeah, I just finally yeah. had to, I was looking for him to text him to say, John, I have to leave. I can't under, I can't answer people's questions. Um, <laughs> so this seemed like there was a max. Maybe it was my, I don't think it was my device, but maybe it's my internet. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that go into that. It could be the time of the night bandwidth stuff. Like well, I know yeah, Zoom, I Zoom even had a lot of problems. His, he has a, a, he has a face or a, he's on YouTube. So he live streams and it's on YouTube or something. So I mm -hmm. went and looked at the video on YouTube just because I was I wanted to make sure it wasn't me because if it was me I think I'd try to figure out maybe I have to use my you know computer instead or something and mm -hmm. the video that I saw was all choppy you know and I thought yeah. well, maybe he doesn't see it because he's the moderator or something I don't know mm. Yeah, it's it's such an in in exact science, but I'm surprised we can do all of this. I think <laughs> we, the only one that's really good for that is Zoom because I think it was designed specifically to have for large groups. Yeah. yeah. Well, is this is Streamyard a a for? Do you have to pay to be a moderator? Do you have to pay to to use it for your for uh, for Zoom or for, for your, Streamyard? No, for Streamyard. Yeah, there's different there's different tiers, yeah. which really breaks down into how many places you want to broadcast. Oh, oh okay. So yeah, that's really a, how that all comes tool. in. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing tool when you think it was very easy to sign into. Zoom is a little harder. I had to get the app, and uh, it's a little trickier to try to get you know. Right, I mean, you have to get yeah, the stars aligned. Yeah. Imagine that's the thing about technology, just like being able to print small, you know, print runs of a comic and have it come out really beautifully. It's amazing that you have this ability as a, if you were, a, if I was 18 years old or 17 years old, I would be doing self-published stuff. You know, mm -hmm. I think that would just be it. You know, yeah. maybe you'd scratch the itch with wanting to work for Marvel or DC, but I think those are tools that we didn't really have, you know? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You had photocopying. <laughs> yeah, the Kiko special as we used to call it. But then you can you can basically advertise yourself on the uh, internet as well. So that's another tool that a lot of, I think, kids take for granted. But it's you're promoting, you know, and it's mm -hmm. basically Twitter's free. All these things are generally free. You're selling your soul, but you're not having to pay a monthly f service fee. <laughs> so that and that's where you're mostly for people who want to to connect with you. You're mostly a Twitter guy now, right? Yeah. You're yeah. not on. I don't really see you on Facebook much. Only. I, Facebook, I specifically, I mean, Twitter is on my iPad, so it's handy for me to do it, check it. With Facebook, I, I, I didn't want to put it on my iPad because Facebook is, Twitter can be a time drain, but Facebook's worse. And Facebook, it hypnotizes me, and then suddenly I go, wait, it's midnight or something, and I'm like, how have I spent three hours on this, you know? It's a time drain. 
You're crunching, Jamar. <laughs> They're saying it's time to go. <laughs> He's getting the electronic hook. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, take us home. Okay. Well, um, so people want to – what's what's your Twitter handle, Jerry? It's at Jerry Ordway. Okay. And um, thanks again for, for – uh, No problem. And hopefully we sell a bunch of uh, Power Shazam so that they do Volume 2 and Volume 3. Well, somebody just announced the other day that they announced Volume 2? They solicited it for early next year public publishing in, like, February or something okay. or March. Yeah. So that, that'd be cool. It'd be nice if they could get through a series and just, I don't know how they sell them or whatever, but I think Amazon's a big, you know, must be a big seller for these things. So yeah. look, look for it on Amazon. It's available next week. Um, it's a nice package. Yeah. You got your comps. Yeah. I just, I got them while I was uh, out of town. So yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. No, it's cool. The other thing I thought was cool, I guess. I don't know if you if you took it out of the slip case, but I thought that was kind of neat that the the under the the paper sleeve they did the Shazam poster that oh the yeah poster which is kind of cool. So I mean they put a little effort. I mean I did a lot of scanning for them, but um, they they put some effort into it, which is is nice. Great. Well, <laughs> we will uh, see you on the Twitter. <laughs> they say. Mm -hmm. And feel free. I'll I'll do. I'm always happy to talk because that's what I'm good at. Blah blah blah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jerry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Well, I appreciate Thanks, it, Jerry. It yeah, was, we had a great time. And um, fans will be back on Saturday with another special guest, and I'll advertise it as we get a little deeper into the week. Which is almost over. So, uh, for our good buddy Jerry Ordway, thanks for hanging out with us on our closing. Mike Manley, this has been Jamar Nicholas. You've been listening and watching Pencil to Pencil. Uh, as always, don't forget, wash your hands. Wash your hands, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> See you soon. Yep.